Thank you so much for coming back. Ah, it's a pleasure. It's a joy to have you again. I was telling you off air that we had a really successful episode last time you came on. Um, we had so many people engaging with it. And I think what was so fascinating to me about this, uh, sorry, last time, was seeing people on TikTok, no less, yeah. debating taxation policy, talking about all the different ideas that they can, you know, that they have about how to make society fairer. I didn't expect that from TikTok, but you you, you generated no, uh, well, that I, sort I of- I think TikTok, uh, personally, I, I mean, I shouldn't do this. My kids actually hate it when I use TikTok because I'm a 57 year old fat man <laughs> and I'm not supposed to be doing it. But um, uh, its algorithm is absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, I very much take the view, I understand all the counter arguments mm. about, you know, the sinister possibilities for misinformation or for, uh, you know, data capture. Uh, and, um, but personally, as a yeah. consumer, I think it's fantastic. You know? Yeah. I mean, I suppose it's the, in a sense, you know, you know, by saying that the opposite of a good idea is another good idea, which yeah. is one of my mantras. And... Uh, you know, the two things I enjoy most out of the internet, mm. other than just the internet itself at the most banal level, yeah. uh, YouTube and TikTok. I mean, one of the things I recommend everybody does is nobody nobody has YouTube premium. And one of my <laughs> one of my proposals is that actually the BBC should ramp should do a deal with YouTube, okay? Ramp up the license fee by five quid and give everybody in the UK TikTok premium. Really? Because if you think about it, what could be more public service broadcasting than YouTube? Okay, not only can you watch anything you like, yeah. which is highly informative, but you can actually post anything you like. Yeah. I mean, that is the ultimate public service broadcaster. And what I, what I love about it is it's now reached a point both in terms of quality of filmmaking. I mean, I think a lot of people still have a sort of folk memory from when it was all shot on kind of, uh, you know, absolutely crappy yeah, handheld yeah, cameras yeah. and you only watched on your phone because it was kind of pixelated and fuzzy. And now, I mean, the majority of it seems to be kind of broadcast quality 4K. Yeah. Okay. And it's become, it's reached that kind of tipping point where it's become Wikipedia with video, where I, I don't <laughs> think most people use it that way because they still sort of browse it. Yeah. But actually, you can search for any goddamn thing you're interested in, yeah. and there's something about it on YouTube. This is it. You know, if you're interested in the Potsdam conference, if you're interested in whatever, someone's made a film about it. Yeah. And that's astounding, I think. I mean, it really is just truly astonishing. For sure. I mean, it, it actually re reminds me again, one of the key things I loved about the video we put up in the last conversation we had is how somehow t TikTok found us all the people who are passionate about taxation. Yes. <laughs> I and somehow they gathered in our comment section. So I was like, wow, for finding communities, it is unmatched. However, it may well, actually, be banned. Actually, it's interesting because it does have a value in that one of my weird, yeah. other than taxation policy, I might get onto Georgism later. <laughs> okay. Because maybe, Exciting maybe, stuff. <laughs> just maybe, TikTok is the way you get Georgism mainstream. Mm. Uh, and the reason for that is that Years before there was even TikTok, yeah. uh, anybody who's seen me before will know this, I was a massive air fryer evangelist. Really? And what I, I noticed have one. about air fryers is that everybody, nobody wanted one, but yeah. everybody who bought one became this kind of swivel-eyed, freakish evangelist <laughs> going around going, that's the beauty of the air yeah. fryer. And TikTok, by feeding in tons of air fryer recipes, finally drove the air fryer mainstream. Really? So in the US, there's actually a magazine called Air Fryer Monthly oh for gosh. air fryer users, okay? A printed magazine. <laughs> but actually, as a way of surfacing things yeah. in unexpected places, that algorithm, which you know undoubtedly could be used for evil, mm. has a certain kind of potential to it, doesn't it? I mean, it does, but it seems as though, though, I mean, I think I read just not so long ago that, that Montana has become the first state ah. to ban TikTok. 
The now, U.S. states have a power to do that within that interesting. I believe I believe I read that. Now, I would have thought there's some sort of interstate commerce. Defense. Well, I know yeah. that, you know, I'm sure you, you've seen all the sort mm. of hearings when the CEOs had to go in and be like, you know, it's really good. You know, it's, you know, it's, mm. it's a good platform, as it were, as, as they asked, as those old um, senators like ask these odd questions yeah, like, so how do you turn it on? No, 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 no. I think one of them asked, how do you turn it off? And he was like, you, you stop using it? And he's like, but if you can't turn it off, I mean, it's always on. And you're like, these guys clearly a, shouldn't be regulated it's a, it's social a, media. It's actually a fair point, which is, although notionally, you know, you can give away location permission yeah, only yeah, when yeah. using the app. How, how easy that is to bypass, I don't know. Mm. The, the lovely story I know from a friend of mine who worked at Orange in the early days. This is the, oh my gosh, the, the, the old, mobile phone network. What a throwback is they actually foresaw, in a weird way, the problem yeah. of connectivity. And Hans Snook, who is the, um, uh, the kind of, in a sense, the creator and chief executive of Orange, yeah. actually proposed having a product manager for the off button. So just as you have a product manager for some <laughs> SMS or a product yeah, manager yeah. for other features of, of the phone, he actually wanted to have a product manager for the off button because he thought that there were actually, you know, the off button had a certain utility. Mm. And that is, of course, the, the huge problem with, I mean, it's, it's interesting because it's a classic example of an asymmetry. OK, um, email is a curse because I have to check my email five times a day because of the 2% chance something really important and time sensitive has come in. <laughs> yeah. now, it almost certainly hasn't. I mean, yeah. Most of them are going, you know, the window cleaners are in on Wednesday. Can you remember to clear your desk? Okay. <laughs> Which is not time sensitive or even important. Okay. But I have to keep checking just in case. And you have to leave your phone switched on just in case. Yeah. And we could have thought these things. I mean, technically, email, you would solve that problem because every email has the facility to add a high importance. Yeah. Uh, no one uses it. that. No one. No one uses no it. No one uses it. And the only people who use who use it are probably slightly spamming nuts you or, or weird. Yeah. Or they're spamming you, <laughs> yeah. okay? And it's gameable. But that thing where the burden on determining what's important falls on the recipient, not on the sender, mm -hmm. is a problem of a lot of tech. And because of that, Okay, what I really want is a phone you can turn. Well, actually, I solved this by having two phones. Okay, uh, oh, so you got a work phone and a burner, as I call it. <laughs> it's not a burner. Oh no, Rory, me, what's it, it, what are you doing on that phone? Exactly, makes me sound a lot cooler to call it my burner phone than say. Um, and the reason I got a second phone was actually that I was in China once and I lost my phone okay. for twenty four hours. And I just thought, I'm not receiving you, this you ever again. You bought one for five pounds you're completely, or something. <laughs> I mean, you're, it, it's, it, it's like being sort of lobotomized because, wow. you, know, you know, you're so dependent on the thing for forms of information. And, um, uh, but, but you really need a phone, which is, you know, you know your wife and close family members yeah. can call, but no one else can. But the difficulty is how you actually, because I've tried that, you know, I've tried mm. to say, Mike, you need a life, you know, you've got to split your phone, uh, so split your life up into work and mm. play as it were. But there's, you know, for many of us, work is often play. And so before you know it, you have that contact that you go, well, they are a colleague, yes, but, no, but they're also, they're a, also a, a friend. Exactly. And, and then yeah. once you have six of those, the whole thing, then, they, then, then you get to that issue where I have friends now that have two phones. When I click on their name, the two numbers come up and I'm like, I don't know which one to call. And it gets all sort of messy. And, and then before does, you yeah. know it. Yeah, yeah, my PA has two phones, a personal phone and a work phone. I always ring the wrong one. This they is both it. end in a one, two, this is which it. makes it even worse. <laughs> uh, and, and you're right. And then, then of course, WhatsApp completely breaks oh, down. Oh gosh, yeah. yeah. So you just, you just call yeah, everyone. Yeah, I just call everybody or text but I, I love that you tried and that at least you have yeah, sort of that separation I mean, I'm, I'm intrigued by the tell question you know I, I think the flexible working debates a really really interesting thing because yeah. I think let's be honest about it okay um uh, 30 to 40 percent of it is a middle class form of trade unionism it's a yeah. kind of work to rule okay now that's not to say that it's a bad thing mm. I would argue that the uh the interests of capital you know, even as a right of centre person politically, yeah. I think the amount of attention paid to the, you know, the needs of capital versus the needs of labour has got out of whack. And that there have been a lot of technological developments which have caused the work life to impinge on your private life. And it's not entirely unreasonable at this point that people yeah. should say, can we actually have the tide flowing in the other direction? And by the way, what is the point of all this tech, OK, if it doesn't change the way we work and travel and move? Uh, now... You know, I would say that, you know, if you look at any sort of revolution in something, yeah. then 
the definition almost of a revolution is that its effects are visible from the air, right? Mm. You know, whether it's canals or railways or whatever, or, you know, suburbanization or, you know, the spread of cities or cars or whatever, yeah. okay? Now, if we develop all this tech that effectively is there to make geography irrelevant, okay, mm. and yet we don't change our working patterns at all in response, then that isn't just bad for quality of life. Yeah. In some way, it's stupid. Well, the sort of Hey there, just want to say thank you for listening or for watching uh, this podcast. Uh, we have a great desire to grow this podcast. And one of the ways we're going to do that is if you listening uh, follow or if you are watching, you subscribe to the podcast. The faster it grows, um, the more guests we can get, but also the better the podcast gets. So please just do me a favor, hit the subscribe button or the follow button. Um, back to the episode. Two things there you mentioned. One of them is the tech part, which whilst it excites some people, it's also terribly frightening for some, which we'll come to. Interesting. But the question about sort of this work from home thing, I'm sure you've seen, I mean, more and more companies are like, all right, you've had your fun, come to the office now. Yeah. Four days, we want you out in four days. And in fact, Elon Musk, not too long ago, tried to make it a moral thing, where he said he, think it's, he thinks it's, it's morally wrong, the kind of the laptop class, if you like, folks who kind of like, you know, yeah. do all these, tech, uh, these kind of uh, remote stuff can you know argue to work from home two days a week whatever it is whereas folks who are key workers lifting the stuff building they have to be in every week and he said it's not morally right to create a, two, a kind of a two-tiered system of although although the extent to which laptop workers are paid relative to essential workers is another moral question and that's another thing uh, as well which, which is i mean the it, 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 it i mean it really interests me this because um at some level, there's another moral question, which yeah. is, um, for example, call centre work could provide really meaningful and good employment if, with flexibility to older people, people with disabilities, people who are carers, people with other commitments. Yeah. You could also argue that the main disadvantage that women experience in the workplace is that if they're away from the workplace parenting for a period of years, it's simply you lose... It's not really that you lose... Tr um, training or experience mm -hmm. it's usually you lose visibility that's the one you know, it's that woody allen thing about you know what is it you know success is just showing up and so you know allowing people who are um you know on maternity leave to participate remotely in things yeah. is you know one of, the, one of the other i mean god it's complicated i mean you know one of our other questions i raised to our clients is hold on a second you're entirely debating this from the level of your colleagues okay do i want my colleagues to work remotely what about your customers because um, mm -hmm. If this leads to an extra 10 to 15 percent of after-tax discretionary disposable income, because people don't have to spend so much on travelling, or they don't have to spend, I mean, for example, I mean, one form of flexible working is you go in three or even four times a week, but you work from home early in the morning, and you go in on an off-peak day return ticket, right? Mm -hmm. Which saves you. I'll give, well, I'll give you my my detail uh, with, with a rail card. Okay, <laughs> it's the difference between I think 27 pounds and 10 for a day return. That's £17 a day. Okay, and I don't live very far from London. So, do you have a real card? Yeah. So, does everyone have a real card? Because I thought it was for 16-year-olds or something. No, no, no. Um, and then, are, then I turned, oh, like, I took okay, 20, okay. and they're like, you this can have is, a 20-year-old one. And then I was like, many, So, ah. you can have a network rail card which works on off-peak tickets, and that's, I think, £20 a year. Um, it, it has certain disadvantages. You can't use it in first class. You also can't use Bugger. it in... Um, uh, <laughs> there's another case. You can't use it on, on... It'll only discount down to a certain set amount. However, there's a very clever hack in the southeast. Okay. Now, again, you can find this on YouTube, okay, <laughs> which is you buy an annual season ticket between yeah. St. John's Esplanade and St. John's... Uh, let me get this right. I love the specificity. Uh, uh, um, is it Pierhead? Okay, there are two stations on the Isle of Wight. Okay, uh, it might be. I think it might be St John's Road and St yeah. John's Esplanade. Okay, on the Isle of Wight, I've got one of those annual season tickets. I've never been to the Isle of Wight in my life, right? And you're going to be going, what the hell is this guy on about? Why would you have a season ticket? They're going to close the loop get? after you say this. And, and the reason is that. That gives you what is called a gold card, which is the annual season ticket. You have to okay. buy the annual one. It doesn't work if it's quarterly or monthly. But if you buy an annual one, which is about £160, that gives you a network gold card, which gives you uh, pretty massive privileges um, in any form of off-peak travel anywhere in the network southeast area, 
it's effectively a benefit from the old network southeast, which was grandfathered in. Got you. But if you go, um, uh, if you go on um, uh, on YouTube, there's a whole uh, YouTube episode about these freakish season tickets. <laughs> Uh, which uh, everybody finds actually that isn't the cheapest one, but it has slight advantages over one that's a few pounds cheaper. Mm. Uh, I mean, literally, I mean, you'd need full legal training to understand the full terms <laughs> and conditions. But, but I mean, interestingly, in Germany, they have, um, I think, rail cards, which we should probably have for, for people of normal age. Got you. OK, which is... Um, uh, they, you can either have a barn card 25 or a barn card 50, or indeed a barn card 100. And the, the, they're variously hundreds to thousands of, of Deutsch, oh, euros, God bloody hell, of euros every year, OK? Yeah. But they give you 25%, 50%, or 100% off any rail journey you make in Germany. And so, I mean, this is equ equivalent to what you might call a kind of Uber... Um, uh, a, a kind of Uber rail card. Got you. Now, it's, it's interesting because um, economically, these things interest me because obviously people who do something a lot are more price sensitive than people who do something only occasionally. OK. And these things are a bit like Amazon Prime. Mm. And Amazon Prime, which was Bezos's idea, which he forced through against huge it's opposition. It's brilliant, right? It's, now, it, what Bezos, it wasn't initially. No. No, and actually what Bezos spotted was that unless yeah. uh, you actually find a mechanism where people can pay for delivery up front in one go, which obviously drives loyalty because every time you then make a purchase, you feel you're getting your money back. Yeah. Okay? But you couldn't really have frequent customers because 10 people don't mind paying three pounds for delivery once a month. But one person, even if they're pretty rich, doesn't like paying three pounds for delivery 10 times a month. Yeah. And so it's a really interesting way in which you distinguish between a lot of people who do something occasionally. Now, interestingly, OK, having talked about tax policy last time, yeah. I think this should also apply to car parking. OK, I park in Henley, to give an example, probably once a year. <laughs> OK, I don't really care whether it's 10 quid or 13 quid. OK, if I live in Henley and I park there 100 times a year, when they put the price up by three quid, that's 300 quid a year. I've yeah. got five. And so you get this interesting phenomenon. The, the most obvious example of it, which I couldn't understand until I worked this out, is, you know that thing, the Auto Route des Anglais, where if you go across the, through the tunnel at Calais, yeah. uh, in the Euro Tunnel, and then you drive down to the south on the A10, I think it is, in front, right? Every single Godin car for about 70 miles is English. Yeah. Right? Are you going, what, what, you know, don't the French use this motorway? <laughs> and then you realise, of course, the English don't care because they do that trip once a year. The auto route costs them 35 euros. Who gives a shit? It's just part of our holiday. Yeah. If you live there and you do that journey, you know, every day, that starts There's adding up to thousands of euros of after tax that. income. Mm. Now, I think this form of pricing, where do it a lot, pay less actually is welfare enhancing and also revenue enhancing. I think it's actually a win-win. Yeah. I think it's a re it doesn't sound that clever, but it's a really important form of innovation. And you've got to, you've got to help people also track that. Because I think one thing Amazon Prime do very well is they make it very clear to you why you're getting your delivery faster. Mm. It's because mm. you're a Prime member and they have the sort of logo there and you remember it. Because oddly enough, it's one of the, because I, I literally just bought something on Amazon not too long ago. And I thought to myself, it's actually value for money. Like, it feels as though I am yeah. paying for a privilege that I'm actually sort of happy with. Now on the working thing though, curious whether Olga Vida does the sort of four day work week as well. And We're where, and whether, aim for, do you think that's kind of the inevitable sort of where we'll end up? Yeah, I, sort I of think, four days a week. I think it's, <laughs> okay. Uh, I think it's what you might call a kind of epiphany change in mm. that once people realize you can be surprisingly productive at home for some kinds of work. Okay? Yeah. Once people saw that it was possible, I don't think you can put the cat back in the bag. Okay, I think it's a one-way street that to some extent, and of course it's quite interesting because there's a little bit mm -hmm. of a, there's probably a little bit of a kind of um, bootleggers and Baptists um, conspiracy between workers and management. Because mm. if you're older, you probably live further from the workplace, you have a slightly nicer house, you have pretty good tech at home. Okay, there's a little bit of me, I'll be absolutely candid, right, I'm 57, right? I don't want to miss out on this. I feel really sorry for people who retired the year before COVID because they spent, okay, 
35 years of their working life, yeah. 40 years of their working life, slogging into the office. <laughs> and for the last 10 years, or the last six or seven years with Zoom, that was probably, you know, that was, you know, a few thousand unnecessary trips. Yeah. Um, and I think it's also been normalised. And the, the phrase I used is that just making, and a very large part of marketing is just not making things seem weird. And pre-COVID, <laughs> okay, just as QR codes were kind of weird before yeah. COVID, okay, they were, you know, great, you know, an idea with a great future and it always will have. Um, uh, you know, any kind of video conference for work was kind of weird. You did it in extremis or whatever, okay. And it's what I call the difference between buying a Coke and buying a Dr. Pepper. Buying a Coke or asking for a Coke is totally zero friction. That shop across the road, I'm willing to bet you 500 quid, you can buy a Coke there. Yeah. Okay? Now, if you ask for a Dr. Pepper, it's kind of like, <laughs> ooh. Ugh. And then you have to kind of explain it and justify it. You've got to come up with a load of reasons, you know. You know and, you know, and you've got to defend your decision. <laughs> And I always said, you know, you can ask for a Coke in a Jamaican beach shack, you can ask for a Coke in a michelin star restaurant, you can ask for a Coke in pretty much any shop in any major place in the world, and if they haven't got it, it's their fault. Yeah. Right? That's not true of Dr. Pepper, okay? It's your fault for asking, <laughs> right? If you, to, you know, if you go to the Manuel Cat Saison, go, you got any Dr. Pepper Zero, right? Yeah, no. okay, it's not going to happen. <laughs> now, that kind of thing is really interesting because what, what undoubtedly the pandemic had done, it probably didn't need two years to do this it might have actually been equally effective if you'd only just done it for a month mm. is it stopped it feeling weird yeah it also meant that people had to master the tech there's a very weird thing you get in business where among certain older kind of managerial types it's actually high status not to be able to use the tech i'm not making this up there was a very senior guy at ogilvy until about seven or eight years ago whose pa used to fax his email to him fax yeah oh gosh and so he'd be staying at some hotel and you know 47 pages of email would come through on the fax machine <laughs> and he'd sit there and she was maybe maybe he knew what he was doing in a way he'd sit there scribble on all the on all the emails what his response was and fax it back oh to no her. yeah no. no, he must have been doing that to make a point because there's no uh, yeah, way he yeah. thought this is you the see, quickest see, way I to do a, this. There's a kind of thing which is you signal maybe it's status, maybe whatever it is, by being crap at things. Because <laughs> you know, this is, I mean, by the way, um, being able to type in the late 80s or using a, a computer was considered slightly low status because it was secretarial. Oh. And so... I, I can't stand handwriting and I always like typing and so I had to wait for the, literally you'd wait for your group secretary to go off to the loo and you'd immediately run over and start <laughs> typing things. And people going, why are you doing that? You shouldn't be doing that. It's not, you know, and the spreadsheet changed that because yeah, suddenly yeah, for yeah. the first time, managerial types had to have some computing power on their desk. Yeah. When it was just a word processor, um, you know, I remember my wife was in a whole cohort of graduates of British Aerospace who were basically told off by the oldies for doing their own typing. That's so fascinating. Now, weird, okay? Yeah. But now there was also this thing that it was okay to be crap at video, at video conferencing, you know, that somehow it was kind of almost a bit of a badge of honour if you're, you're on mute, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> um, and, and so, now, you know, one of the other things the pandemic did is it forced people to be kind of competent. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, I don't think... Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's going back, and I don't think it should, by the way, because I don't think... Um, uh, I think in very large numbers of jobs, the perfect working environment isn't static. It's yeah. variety. Just as you... I don't know. There may be things you do in a cafe. Yeah. It's certain yeah. writing things where you get the perfect yeah. atmosphere for this yeah. is a cafe. I want a bit of background noise, but I don't want any just direct disturbance. And people also know... People are very different, I think... Uh, in terms of their own particular preference. Yeah. And you could also argue that what the workplace did, pretending it was about teamwork when it was really about cost saving, was it drove the open plan office on everybody all the time. Yeah. Oh God, I hate that. And the problem with the open plan office is that, A, it's neither flesh nor fowl, in that it isn't really solitude and it isn't really sociability, but also it's completely monotone. You can't shut your door, open your door. In an office, you can have a party, or you can sit there on your own, or you can have a nap. Okay? <laughs> now, a very, very close uh, relative of mine said to me, is your office open? Okay, this, this guy was um, 
uh, I suppose he worked from the 1950s to the 1980s or 90s, okay? He said, is your office open plan? Okay. <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. He said, well, how do you have a nap in the afternoon? <laughs> Now, bear in mind, this guy wasn't working on the production line of British Leyland. He was the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Defence. Fascinating. Okay. And it was assumed, I think, back in the 60s and 70s, you'd have a bit of a snooze in the a, office. A siesta. In the I think he's in, the, he's in the wrong country. But, <laughs> but the fact that open plan office doesn't allow for anything yeah. in terms of control over your environment or what you might call variety. I'm a huge fan of that book by Nassim Taleb called uh, Anti-Fragile, yeah. where he makes the point which I think is probably one of the most enlightening kind of epiphany moments I've ever had, which is the right answer to a lot of questions isn't a constant, it's a degree of variance. Mm. Just as, you know, in health, you know, one form of training probably isn't very good. Okay, no. right, and the the idea that actually in complex systems gain from variance up to a point, and I think that's true of work. That actually being able to work in a different uh, setting or being able to control, just as being able to control your temperature, yeah, uh, is optimal. Being able to control your context, an open plan destroyed all of that. Yeah, and so the fact that people who like doing deep work, I mean, David Ogilvy back in the fifties and sixties never wrote anything in the office. So when he wrote an ad, when he wrote a book, he went home. Okay, so it's not. It's obviously not. A, he just said too many distractions in the office. So this isn't a new problem. And so the question is, the right answer to a lot of people is hybrid. Yeah. I take Elon's ethical question. I, I think that's a fair point. I, I guess I suppose it's just rich, I guess, coming from him, is mm. the kind of moral, the, 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 the fact that he thinks he's sort of in the position to make sort of moral claims. I think it's what people, what really kind of got people angry because he took a public company private. I mean, we can yeah. we, we can talk at length about Elon and, and sort of Twitter and how Twitter's go. Because in fact, actually, you, you, actually, you're, you're an avid tweeter, I think. Is, yeah, is that actually, fair? Um, a lot of people were desperate to take a stand against Elon. And I kind of go, um, I get the fact that he's, let's say, not non-neurotypical. Okay? I, I see, I don't think that's people's gripe though. Because you'd, you'd have to spend time with him to really understand the ramifications of that. We see random videos and interviews here and there, and, and, and that's really all we know. But I think folks say that because there is this mad genius sort of folklore that I think a lot of people yeah. kind of like to believe. And I think he's probably benefited from that sort of mad genius status that you know, he he must know what he's doing behind all these sort of moves. Yeah. And, whereas if, if I look at, I mean, if we look at, I mean, not to get too I technical. I probably have the urge to indulge those people in okay. a weird way because their importance in, um, uh, th their importance in, you know, what you might call the, you know, the arc of progress. Yeah. Um, uh, is, 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 you know, Henry Ford. Very weird no, for guy. sure. But let's say, um, but take a look at Twitter. Particularly, and Twitter say Twitter Blue, this kind of subscription yeah. service thing. I, mean, I think even you know from ad, from advertising perspective, advertising I think accounted for something like like ninety percent of Twitter's revenue at, at some stage. Yeah, which I think was a mistake. And Absolutely. But, yeah, and I think that um, uh, it is a service for which people will pay because it well, is genuinely well, useful. Question is how much? Because he said that he thought advertising ought to account for something like 45% of Twitter's income um, or revenue, and that subscriptions will make up essentially the, a large part of the rest. It hasn't gone that way. Um, not yet. <laughs> not uh, yet. No, but, no, he, but even uh, the first year numbers don't seem to be tracking. There's about 700,000 I mean, now. I, I, I paid for it. And the reason yeah. I paid is it's taken me something like 12. I, I, I'm, I think my user number on Twitter is something like number 120,000. So I was in right at the beginning. Okay. Wow. Someone came into my office and said, have you heard about this thing? And I thought this thing, as you call it, is brilliant. And I signed up straight away. <laughs> and um, uh, I, I think I'm in, I, I'm pretty sure, if I'm not in one million territory, I'm in six digit territory in terms of number of users. And it's taken me that many years to get up to what, a hundred and something thousand um, followers. So I can't afford to start over again. It, <laughs> he's got me by the balls because it's a massive case of sunk cost bias, right? I'm not, I'm not going on. What, what's that other competing platform they keep talking Truth about? Truth Social. Okay, first of all, I'm 57. I'm too old to learn a new interface. <laughs> Okay, not quite true. I imagine, I, I imagine it will no. be a worse Twitter. This is what I'm thinking. They will copy a lot of the features. I, I'm not starting again at 17 followers, mate. But, but, I'm but, sorry. <laughs> you know, I, 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 can't, I can't face that. Uh, I mean, if I were 23, I might be making that 
wonderful principal gesture. I'm 57, right? <laughs> you know. No, the, 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 the point I was making more generally. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you saw um, the new CEO, Linda Yak- yeah. Yak- uh, Yakarino, I think her name might be. Uh, That's right. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, you must have seen, you, did you see them at the um, the conference? I forgot. It was an advertising conference. Isn't A it? stream, I think, in LA. Did, did you watch it? They, I, I'm not sure whether they met there, but um, uh, no, I should have gone. That's the really? I might have been there, and then I can't remember. I cancelled going. It was a WPP stream event in yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, in uh, what's that Napa? It was very yeah. odd because it felt as though it was sort of Elon. It, with this interview, I mean, they, they must have known at that stage that she was going to take over as CEO because she essentially came there and was some, almost asking these kind of layup questions to say, we're going to get the advertisers back inside, right? Because obviously they're realizing, I think, that the Twitter blue thing, they they grossly overshot it. I think in the, it, by 2025, the, they thought they would have like um, 16 million paying subscribers. Wow. And within a year, it's, it's around 700,000. A lot of those 700,000 are actually gifts that he gave away to famous people to sort of stimulate people buying. So so clearly they're trying to go back. But what was interesting is... I, I have to say of Twitter is that it was the... Unbel- I mean, his question, which is, what do all these people do? Was a fair <laughs> question. Because here was a system which, you know, server capability yeah. um, uh, aside, okay, basically ran itself. And the pace of innovation or... What you might call or experimentation. Yeah, you know, I mean, people have been asking for the facility to delete for ages. I think the thirty-second delay before you post. Which well, that's only for you, I think, because you're you're a Twitter Blue person. Oh, so Twitter we Blue gets that. a thirty-second delay. Other yeah, you can don't. you can edit the can't you within thirty seconds or something I mean, like I mean, that. I, first of all, I think there are tweaks you can do which make make the whole thing of nastiness. Yeah, of just gratuitous trolling. Um, uh, you know, less problematic. Okay, yeah. uh, there's a very interesting, very interesting idea, which, by the way, was you know advanced by partly us and partly by a sister WPP agency in the battle against knife crime. Is mm-hmm. that uh, basically if you can get anybody to wait twenty seconds, okay, <laughs> they don't do it. Right? <laughs> there's this kind of weird surge of anger. Yeah. And if you wait for it to subside, you almost certainly moderate what it is you yeah. you, you, you say or do. That's fascinating. I don't, it's I don't really know about fascinating. The basically, thing, yeah. and the, the whole premise was you know don't end up with a nine-year sentence for the sake of 30 seconds yeah. it's effectively that you know the- hey there just want to say thank you for listening or for watching uh this podcast uh we have a great desire to grow this podcast and one of the ways we're going to do that is if you listening uh follow or if you are watching you subscribe to the podcast the faster it grows um the more guests we can get but also the better the podcast guests. So please just do me a favor, hit the subscribe button or the follow button. Um, back to the ep- the premise of that that thing. Um, I th- and, and, and actually, there's one thing which, if he does it, I'll forgive him everything, which is getting micropayments working. Because okay. his great plan is to have a micropayment system where you can pay for paywalled content um, uh, one page at a time. Okay. And the reason it doesn't happen is just the sheer cowardice of the finance people who run the subscription model. The subscription models run out of road. Okay, yeah. I'm not going to subscribe to anything else. Okay, <laughs> was right? Twitter your last? <laughs> okay, that was my. Lo- you know, I'm not. You know, otherwise I just become basically a prisoner of my own direct debits. You know, it's kind of like <laughs> salary comes in, salary goes out. <laughs> yeah, 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 right? you know, I've got Sky, I've got, you know, I've got Vodafone, I've got, you know. It's a funny, right, how every business became a subscription-based business. Every goddamn business. It's yeah, ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. And th- by the way, there's a nice form of subscription which needs to be experimented with more, including by publishers, uh, which is the Nespresso form of subscription. Oh, yeah. Where you, uh, where you put the money in, but it builds up as a credit balance. You can ask for it back yeah, if you I, I, I shamefully it. have I'm that. Cool, I'm cool yeah, with that. I have that. Yeah. You know, you know. <laughs> I use it too. <laughs> yeah, I use it yeah. a lot. That yeah. was, that, what a business. It, I, I, it's such oh. a, it's so good. And yeah. even, even as a, even for coffee snobs, I hmm. think Nespresso has a, a special section, which is you haven't yeah. got the time, you want some good coffee. James Hoffman's not a fan, is I, he? Oh, though? he's not a fan. Well, I, well, I, I've, always, I, I've always suspected I, yeah. that James Hoffman goes off screen. <laughs> At the very end of the day, he goes, oh, fuck it, I'll make a cup of instant. <laughs> right. And my, my, my argument for Nespresso, he, he is actually very fair, James. I, I mean, like him. It's very fair, I, very I balanced. Yeah. And he acknowledges that, A, Nespresso only heats the water you need. That's actually, the one. Actually, aluminium is recyclable. Yeah. I always send my pods back. I'm pretty yeah. good with that. Um, uh, and, um, but also... Let's be honest, 
the coffee you really need from your machine is first thing in the morning. Yeah. And I haven't got time for tamping or dialing in first thing in it's the morning. It's great to watch, you yeah. know, sort so of folks making their own coffee and grinding. And, but I just think, you know, I've got literally 10 minutes. I, yeah, I've got 10 minutes. I want a pretty damn good hit. That's the and one. And boy, it's good at that. He was, he, was an, he was a magician, wasn't he? That was in a, in a previous life. Before he became, yeah. he was World Barista of the Year. Yeah, yeah, before he, yeah. he was, I think he was selling machines. And then before that, he was also like a magician or something. Yeah. Just really random. But. I, I always, <laughs> this is a really mischievous suggestion. I'm probably going to get thrown off the internet with this. Oh, no. I've always wanted things like sex advice with James Hoffman. <laughs> like where, where there's like, you know, 40 minutes of preparing the lighting. And he's, go, he's going around with a sort of light meter, you know, going, you know. You know. <laughs> I was watching James when I wasn't really into coffee, but I would watch this one hour long review video and I'll just get sucked into it. And I'm just there watching it, pretending to know what he's talking about. And I think there's, there's another conversation to be had about sort of something really stimulating about someone who really knows something. Uh, this who, is glorious. Who goes into it. There's a bit in, of majesty in, in behind any it field, There's a group of people who know more than is actually healthy. Yeah. <laughs> and oddly, if you, for the other. Uh, it's, it's, it's a minority, but it's a yeah. minority of people who are curious, right? It's always worth remembering there are a lot of people who aren't curious. Yeah. If they found a way of doing something, they're not interested in finding another way, you know. But for the 40% or so of people who are really curious, those people are fantastic. I mean, I remember watching on YouTube, there's a thing about if in the winter the condensation pipe from your boiler freezes and blocks the, um, <laughs> effectively blocks the exhaust of your boiler, okay, it's a big problem and you need to solve it. And there's a sort of eight minute video showing you how to do it. I remember thinking, okay, for someone whose boiler isn't blocked, this is genuinely the worst television in the world, okay? I mean, it's almost a Monty Python idea of what bad television would be, okay? But if your boiler exit pipe has frozen over... Yeah. That's actually better than The Godfather Part 2. Yeah, right? it's, it's brilliant. It's, it's brilliant, uh, brilliant viewing. <laughs> and it's, it's really odd how, I mean, that sounds like something I'll be doing at 2 a.m. Mm. Just randomly watching these yeah. videos. And then I'm just like, what, what's going on? But before we go down that rabbit hole, the, there is another fear. So, so I have, and I think Obama shares it. It's always good to share things with Obama. Um, he has a new series out on Netflix. Um, this is not paid promo, but this is, this is kind of in keeping what we're talking about, which is about working. So it's really fascinating. He explores, it's, it's a docu-series where he explores sort of the, just the working life of sort of, I think, four or five people in different industries. So you've got the, um, I think, healthcare, you've got kind of yes. the delivery, whatever. And, and what they're trying to figure out, as it were, is, is essentially what automation, tech, AI, what it will mean for those jobs. So like kind of the woman who, who or the man who cleans um, the hotels after, you know, yeah. after, you, after you're gone. And it got me thinking, actually, every job and every sort of, in every sector, obviously needs to respond to AI in some capacity. But I wonder if we're almost too late in a sense in that I, I, I genuinely don't know. It's an interesting question whether the gains go to labor in the shape of leisure or to capital hmm. and that you end up with this, I can't remember who it is who spoke about the question of you're either above the API or below the API, that you have this sort of two class society, mm. which is you're either doing the programming or you're obeying what the program tells you to do, mm. you know, and there's this massive struggle to be above the API, as it were. And um, I'm, I, I'm intrigued by that. I, I, I genuinely don't know. In fields like advertising, it can undoubtedly be valuable, okay? Yeah. Simply in shape of stimulus. Also, I'm also interested in what I call artificial inquisitiveness, not artificial intelligence, which is don't make this thing make decisions, make it point out interesting things to you. Mm. You know, um, uh, uh, you know. so, you know, set, setting it to work on a data set and having it come up with the anomalies might be a more valuable use of its time than coming up with the generalities. Got there you. are a whole load of tough questions because it is, of course, a plagiarism engine. Yeah, uh, and that has implications both for you know school exa school essays, but it has implications for the people who wrote the stuff in the first place. Apparently, they can figure out if you cheated. But for me, I feel like if I had that when I was in school, I would absolutely just use it and then just edit it, and yes. it should be fine. You, you've got to edit quite a bit, I suspect, because then there'll be a race between software which detects plagiarism. That's the one. Um, my solution is you put loads of swear words in, because then obviously you wrote it yourself. <laughs> you know, William the fucking Conqueror, right? 
<laughs> okay. Bloody, bloody right, because because then, you know, you know or, or, or absolutely un- inappropriate language. Yeah. Of any kind, right? Or just wrong dates here and there. Yeah, just exactly. bits and bobs. Well, you, have actually, to, you have to check it, it twice. Shit up. Yeah, I mean, it, it has done I that. I looked myself up. Likewise. I did the same thing. Were well, you about awarded me. a CBE? I was awarded a CBE <laughs> uh, in 2017 or it something. Me- it means right? one's coming, Rory. That's what that means. Uh, it knows. It knows in advance. <laughs> uh, the other thing is, it said I, I studied. PPE, which I didn't, I studied classics, and it says I work for McKinsey and Company, which is practically libel in my book. <laughs> okay? So, um, uh, and all it does is it constructs something that sounds plausible. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we're yeah. really careful about this. I, 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 it told me I was raised, born and raised in North London, which is wild, because I was born, I was raised in South London, like, which that, is, that's that, that, that's, I mean, that's I literally, libelous. if it was a person, yeah. I would have Threw a punch or something. Yeah, <laughs> but um, so like you know, so there's all these different. It also told me I won awards I hadn't won, and it, it, it it's it's really. But I I was thinking, where did it get this from? Like how, where where's no. the data set? Because uh, yes, there's articles out there on some can of the stuff I've done. Way, but how did it North London, the South London thing? Can I do the funniest yeah. thing that happened to me, which which <laughs> is a real reflection on human psychology? So my daughter has a DNA test. Done, yeah. Okay, and it turns out she's. Six percent Ghanaian, okay. Oh, which interestingly, because my of my wife's different ancestry, <laughs> means that I'm kind of like ten percent Ghanaian. I go, this is a bit weird because you know I would have thought a Ghanaian community in the far north of Scotland would have kind of you know in the nineteenth century would have aroused a bit of attention. You see, and so I contacted Nassim Taleb, and he said, no, 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 it's reverse correlation. It's not oh. that there were a lot of Ghanaians in Sutherland; it's that there were a lot of Sutherlands in Ghana. And sure enough, I go over to no uh, way. Ghana, and Sutherland, other than Scotland, the highest incidence of the surname Sutherland is, is I think, in Ghana. Okay, no, sorry, it's St Vincent and the Grenadines. Okay, okay. Now, I like to think they were there doing missionary work. I'll be absolutely <laughs> honest with you; um, I don't think they were. Okay, but some of them. <laughs> okay, well, I'll be candid with you here, right? Okay. I'm I think they I don't were, think but. so as well. But then here's the weirdest thing. So my daughter's then on the phone to one of her friends. You yeah. mentioned your South London, yeah. calling you a North Londoner is <laughs> basically, you know, fighting talk, right? <laughs> my daughter's, you know, I, I've discovered this affiliation, this kind of, you know, weird relatedness, yeah. literally 20 minutes before when her DNA tests arrived. She's then on the, on the phone to one of her friends and says, and according to the DNA test, I'm 6% North African. <laughs> and I shouted across the room, we're not fucking North African, <laughs> we're West African. <laughs> now, I, was, just, just tribal. Just, I was actually angry. You know, you know, here I am linked to the kind of, you know, Ashanti or, you know, or whatever. And, and, and here you are, kind of... It's really weird. So, they're probably, they're, I, I should have given that talk at NatCon. The idea that kind of roots and origins place. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's probably one of the most intelligent conservative texts is that book, The Distinction Between Subwares and Anywheres. Yeah. Um, by Good Heart. Oh, really good book. Really um, interesting book. Really good book. Someone recommended it to me when I was in Manchester, actually. Did they have a connection to Manchester at all? Maybe they're from Manchester. I don't know. Uh, what's his name? Is it Philip Goodhart, is it? Or is it Goodhart? Is that his dad? Like the somewheres and the anywhere and, and, and the kind of anywheres. search for community and, and stuff like that. Really people. good he book. Says, you know, the, the largest group of people are kind of somewheres. Yeah. Then there's a group of people, probably including me, who are kind of in between. Yeah. Okay. And then there's a group of people who are effectively have no attachment to Literally. place. Literally, they move to different places. Or whatever. And, yeah. yeah. It's really it's a really fascinating book. I mean, to to, to your point on, on identity, because I think this is this is where I want us to go. Because um, you write for the Spectator, so you yeah. might. You you, you must have an idea what conservatism is, and you, you may <laughs> yeah. you may have seen folks are trying to re, trying to de- define what conservatism is. And at NatCon, you had all these different prescriptions. Yes. Um, what's your take? What what is conservatism? Jonathan Haidt claims there isn't really conservatism. Okay, mm. there isn't really a cohesive. Uh, movement that you can call conservative, mm. uh, that conservatism arises as a common sense reaction to the excesses of the left. <laughs> okay, so it's simply a movement that exists, kind of, which is, uh, hold on a second, D- effectively, uh, def- and, and this is, by the way, a very, very valuable function. Um, you come across, I think, this idea of the Chesterton's fence, mm. okay, which is, G.K. Chesterton said, it's very easy to come across some structure or some institution okay and say i don't know what that thing is supposed to do so since i can't understand what it's for i'll get rid of it okay and he says 
absolutely not. Do not do that. The very fact that something doesn't make sense to you immediately isn't a reason to get rid of it, because yeah. at some other time or place, someone had a reason to put effort into constructing it. And it may well be that its survival is a product of the fact that it has a function, even if that function is difficult to define at any given moment. Yeah. Okay. And so it's very much the idea that uh, effectively trying to... I mean, someone, which is, I think, a fair criticism. Someone once described socialism as the erroneous belief that you can get things right first time. <laughs> okay, that in other words, you, you develop a theory mm. and then you impose that on reality. And where I think conservatism is right is that the really interesting things emerge from the bottom and spread up. Okay, mm. and so top-down attempts to make society make sense... And the question you've got to ask is, makes sense from whose perspective? Because it tends to mean from the perspective of a ruling class, right? OK. Um, uh, generally don't go very well. Mm. OK. Whereas things that emerge and then travel upwards are much more successful. So th I suppose a very simple thing is that a conservative, I would say, has a biologist's view of the world. And um, the more extreme less nuanced people on the left would have an engineer's or a physicist, a Newtonian physicist view mm. of the world. And what's the difference between both approaches, would you say, to, well, to well, policy, well, to social order, these sort of things? I mean, one of the things I do find is that dogma is the, um, the enemy of creativity, in a sense, because uh, it tends to adopt very linear, straightforward solutions to problems, mm. uh, which is if something is bad, we directly oppose it. Now, most of the problems, if we look back at history, are actually kind of solved obliquely. Mm. Or accidentally, actually. That's another thing, which is one of the things is that if you make society very kind of smooth, okay, okay, you get rid of the unevenness, okay? Mm. You also get rid of the variety, and when you get rid of the variety, you get rid of the luck. Now, I, I have... I, this, this may scandalise my colleagues in the behavioural science business, but my argument about behavioural economics and behavioural science mm -hmm. is that it actually works two ways. Sometimes it's right, and it tells you, don't do what the economists tell you to do, do this, and it's right about that, and the new thing you do works. Yeah. Sometimes it works because it encourages you to test something slightly stupid, mm -hmm. OK, which a rational person would never even bother to try, and sometimes by the law of averages, those things kind of work, mm -hmm. OK? So, you know, it, it, it's always interesting to look at, um, uh, you know, I mean, ge genuinely, you know, I mean, if we're being honest about science, the greater part of breakthroughs in science have been a kind of weird mixture of perversity and, ac you know, an, an accident. Yeah. OK. Um, I mean, at the time, they had huge trouble getting penicillin kind of adopted because it came from one guy from an accidental discovery in uh, uh, St Mary's Hospital, Paddington, involving fungus. At the time, the big fashionable thing to focus on was something called super sulfides, which were kind of bacteriological fighting chemicals. And you, what tends to happen is that the, the planned solution to the thing... Yeah. OK, either is, first of all, when it fails, if you have that particular mindset, when your plan fails, you don't give it up and try something else. You actually then impose the plan even more rigorously. <laughs> you, you know, the reason that communism didn't work is that we were insufficiently yeah, we didn't, rigorous. We didn't in try hard it, enough, yeah. You know, et cetera. Um, we didn't, you know, we didn't try hard enough. We must just keep trying, you know, yeah. because... Um, and I think, I think the acknowledgement of... This is why the, the huge urge to define conservatism is, in a sense, slightly counterproductive, because you might argue that conservatism arises from a contentment with a kind of messiness in the world. Hmm. Well, um, well, the reason I ask is because, obviously, I mean, we, said, we spoke about this off here as well. The Conservatives, the party, in the UK at least, is clearly preparing for a period in, opposi in opposition um, where they'll have to really sort of come to terms of what, what exactly, you know, they are opposing, as it were. Like, what is it that... Because there is consensus, economically speaking, at least. I like Rishi, actually. I, I think well, it's a bit it, of a pity it, that he only gets, you know, a fraction of a turn. Well, a lot of people don't call him... A lot, like, at NatCon... Yeah. They don't call him they conservative. They, they say he's not, he's not really conservative. He's a bit technocratic. He's a bit probably kind of, you know, 
Goldman-esque. I, th- I think you could put him next to Tony Blair and Keir Starmer, and there's really only really a, a few steps in between them. I mean, there no, is not that. ideologically, but but in terms of how their approach to, to to things, maybe not Tony, but I, I mean, the the one thing I will say is that the conservatives agonise quite a lot understanding the left, whereas the left tend to write conservatism off. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, so there is an asymmetry, and then I write for the Spectator, and I occasionally get grief for that. But I can put a Marxist position in my column on the Spectator; no one will blink. Okay, mm. you know, I, I'm a Georgist, which is obviously you know fairly <laughs> dissenting. Okay, yeah, and no one minds me basically bigging up Georgism and Liam Halligan does in the Telegraph etc okay uh, so it's actually it's pretty it, it's a broader church in terms of coping with dissenting ideas I, I, I totally agree I think the, I think the, I think the left and Labour Party generally have this odd purity test that everyone mm. has to pass and are very happy to sort of just dismiss people if they don't line up with this with a sort of John McCorter makes this point about sort of um almost like it's, it's almost like intellectual Nazism in a sense. Yes. Yeah. Um, which I think is something that is a proclivity for folks who are like academic and on the left. Yeah. Because to have to have this kind of very thin oh, idea well, of what, what, well what it comes from is it, it probably is actually partly a product of um I mean, John Maynard Keynes once said that people would often prefer to be precisely wrong than vaguely right. Yeah. And the need for absolute certainty, you know, the need to make absolutely unambiguous statements about gender Mm. so that you can clear it up in your own mind, okay, is probably more of a proclivity of the left than it is of the right. For sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, and that need to have what you might call, you know, everything... Everything's either good or evil. Everything has to be in a box. The answer to everything has to be absolutely clear. And it, it becomes then pretty dogmatic uh, as a consequence. Mm. Whereas, as I said, you know, the spectator, I, you know, I could, I mean, I occasionally, you know, I think the Marxist concept of use value versus investment value is pretty useful if you're dissecting the property market in the mm. UK. Because what's happened is that everybody buys property for its investment value, not for its use value, which isn't a problem if it's tulips, right? <laughs> okay, because you don't need to get on the tulip ladder. Yeah. Right? You know, you look at your parents and go, look, son, you've really got to buy some tulips because otherwise, you know, without a nice tulip yeah you know you won't be able to have anywhere to live okay it's a bit of a problem when it's houses yeah right? and um so um i i think well let's let's take an example of this if you take a pro-family position there's a danger you look like a religious nutter or the, well, the question people, is okay. what, what is now, pro-family that's a, that's well, already well, a, one question i would say is that the tax system has done amazingly little for parents really Mm. Okay. Now, by contrast, France is incredibly generous uh, Mm. uh, for people having children. People having children is, to some extent, to the benefit of wider society because it's an investment in the future. Right. I, you know, I had a friend who was childless and um, uh, I made the, you know, I was grumbling about the cost of generally having children. And he said, well, you know, it's your choice. And I said, I don't think your stock portfolio would be worth very much if basically the entire UK stopped breeding. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. You know, to some extent, a lot of this stuff depends on futurity. Yeah. And the um, uh, I mean, the right's wrong about a lot of things, but the right, interestingly, can change its mind. So an example of that would be the minimum wage. Now, that's completely contrary to kind of extreme uh, neoliberal economic dogma. Yeah. But when you introduce... Uh, I think it's a good idea, and I, I think there's a psychological reason for that, which is that the, the danger of, you know... Um, uh, the danger is that a lot of hiring decisions are taken on the lazy heuristic of pay as little as you can. Yeah. Okay? Because that's an easy decision to defend in a boardroom, okay? And so the minimum wage stops that problem. It does create a slight problem, which is it becomes a little bit of a target as well as a, a, a flaw. Yeah. If you're not careful. So okay? do, you, do you agree with raising the minimum wage? Um, uh, yeah, well, generally, empirically, if that seems to work, within reason, yes. Mm. Uh, I, 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 I think. Um, oh, Rory, that makes you a progressive. <laughs> you know, no, no, oh, I <laughs> I'm mean, joking, I'm no, no, I mean, I, I mean, my argument would be that you know, you try these things and watch and see what happens mm. because the consequences of anything. Okay, I mean, I don't know if you've probably read. You might have had her on, uh, Louise. Uh, what's the name? Uh, Louise Perry, who wrote that book, which is very much sort of a kind of. 
a really interesting book, which mm. is a, a, an attack on kind of liberal feminism from oh, a woman's no, I haven't point seen of view. It. Oh gosh, over the last you, 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 be you definitely get her on. Okay? Yeah. Now she makes the point that who would have anticipated that the invention of the contraceptive pill actually led to an increase in births outside wedlock? So <laughs> every single person looking at that would have said, "Well, you know, one definite consequence of this is you know you're going to have fewer births out of wedlock, or you know, so on." Opposite happens, mm. you know. And that unintended consequences thing, the fact that we're actually where, you know, there are huge swathes of things that work for tacit reasons, for reasons we don't understand, yeah. for reasons we can't define, for reasons we can't attach a number to, um, is probably better acknowledged by conservatives than it is on the left, I think. The left, I think mental neatness or mental tractability <laughs> matters more. Yeah. That, yeah, know, and, and yeah. I think even even from a party perspective, I think it's why um, the Conservative Party have been very good at winning elections mm. because they just adapt to whatever they need to be for that moment, and yeah. and you know it's, it's okay. Whereas even on the left right now, I you know there's commentators that routinely just attack Keir Starmer. You kind of wonder why? Why? So what's the point of this? And it's like yeah, he's not he's not left wing enough almost. And you kind of go. Mate, mate, you're about to, you're the, about to be. Are they the angry Corbynistas? Will, essentially, yeah, yeah. but it's, it's odd because you kind of go, you're about to be in power or in office for like it's been 13 years. You should be salivating, excited, mm. and just like let's just get over the line because even a Labour leader that I'm not totally in, you know in love with is better than you know a Conservative who I totally disagree with their worldview. But even with that, even with the closeness and the proximity they have to, to, to office, still some can't hold themselves back and still attack because, as you said, they have this sort of just this obsession with kind of making sure things line up and kind of intellectual yeah. orthodoxy. Yeah, all and, your uh, ducks have to be in a row. This is it, and yeah. it's, I find it quite fascinating. I wonder. What you could argue that it's a mindset which comes from kind of high school science and education, this is which it. is the ability to. This is a, okay. This is a really weird thought of mine, and um, when you think about it, it's actually true. Yeah. Okay. Which is the problem with the intellectual class, which makes them in some ways slightly stupid, okay, <laughs> is that poorer people, ordinary people, have to survive, okay? Mm. They have to get by. They have to make things work. They have to play the hand they're dealt, etc. Yeah, okay? yeah, yeah. Um, a kind of weird intellectual class has been formed who, whose effective motivation is to win arguments. Mm. It's what I call, you know, James O'Brien Jesuits. Oh, God. You know, you know James O'Brien is obsessed with, cons first of all, you form the argument in a way that is artificial, yeah. but which enables you to deploy sequential reason to arrive at a conclusion that is inescapable, okay? Yeah. Now, I think most people drawn from that class, including probably us, think, okay, because it, it's natural to think it, if particularly being brought up that way, that the, the quality of reasoning corresponds to quality of outcome. Yeah. That the course of action which has a better argument for it will also have a better outcome. Yeah. And I, my, my own take on that is I don't think that's true. Okay, mm. I certainly don't think it's an exact correlation but that the best reason will lead to the best <laughs> outcome. And then it leads you into really interesting things in because actually... Behavioural science is kind of a branch of decision theory. Really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one of the things I always, I always scandalise Beatles fans with is that you had this you know, famous terrible decisions, okay, like Decker's decision not to sign the Beatles, mm. okay. So they signed, I think, someone... Um, uh, was it uh, uh, Brian Poole and the Tremolos? I think mm. they signed instead. Now, one of the reasons for that was an appalling reason, which is Brian Poole and the T Tremolos lived somewhere like Deptford. So <laughs> every time they needed to come into the office, that they could come in on their travel card, whereas with <laughs> the Beatles, you'd have to pay for a ticket from Liverpool. Okay? Now, that wasn't a far-sighted move by the procurement department, no. should we say. <laughs> on the other hand, what you have to say is, Based on what that guy knew at the time, yeah. and the Beatles' own demo tapes were mostly covers or one or two original songs that no one's ever heard of, okay? Um, based on what he knew at the time, was that actually a reasonable decision to make, mm. even though the consequences were disastrous? And actually, I think Brian Poole had a number one before the Beatles did, okay? Secondly, um, Love Me Do... Isn't that great a song, <laughs> right? Okay, it's really. I, I'm not saying I could write it. Right? Yeah. I'm just saying there was this weird and completely unpredictable kind of leap between that and I want. It was, I want to hold your hand. Was the next yeah. one that did get to number one. Okay. Um. Actually, okay. 
um, making a decision between acts on the travel costs was not a good idea. <laughs> that should never have been allowed to happen. Yeah. In a weird way, Brian Epstein, okay, oh. um, he, te- he invites one of his more musically, you know, uh, aware friends to see the Beatles play at the Calvin Club and takes the guy out to dinner afterwards. And he said, uh, so what do you think? And the guy said, well, to be honest, Brian, I, I thought they were pretty crap. Right. <laughs> Judging them purely musically, which yeah. has, as is right to do in this weird sense. And Brian's reply was supposed to be, yeah, I think they're pretty crap too, but I think I can really make them into something. Mm. And now, this is the interesting thing, because real decisions depend on potentiality, not on extrapolation from the past. Mm. Okay? Now, one of the things you would have noticed with the Beatles is, my God, they were sodding funny. Mm. I mean, nasty funny in many cases, but... Really, really yeah, funny. Yeah, great witty. characters in general. I mean, I've never forgotten this. It's one of my favourite quotes, which is John Lennon dining, I think, in an Italian restaurant, okay, in London. Um, and someone brings a great big plate of mange to, in amongst all the pasta <laughs> and the chips, there's this huge plate of mange to. And John Lennon picks it up, puts it on an adjacent table, and says, Let's put that over there, away from all the food. <laughs> okay, <laughs> cracking, cracking stuff, you know. I mean, you get a job in an ad agency on that, on that gag alone, okay? Um, and um, actually, one of the dangerous things is, you know, the environment is always changing. You yeah. have to adapt, okay? Um, actually, adapting on the basis of extrapolation from the past is just about a safe way not to get yourself fired in the short term. It makes you look perfectly reasonable because you say, based on these five data points, yeah. what I've done is sensible. But the data points that matter aren't the ones in the past, they're the ones in the future. Sure. And they don't exist yet. Yeah. And so that business... I, I think we've got to be really... I think we've got to be really careful about this because... What is, uh, you know, we we automatically assume that quality of reasoning, quality of argument denotes quality of decision. Yeah. And put it this way, it's let... uh, I'm not saying that, you know, we should just take decisions at random, although there are times when maybe you should, because if you can afford to experiment, experiment. Yeah. But there are undoubtedly cases where um, uh, uh, the... Uh, the quality of argument and quality of reasoning denotes quality of decision much less well than an intellectual caste wants to believe. And, yeah. and, and I, yeah. I, I don't think people get that. Hence why mm. the culture war thing is often front and centre. Yeah. But not, but not on a kind of policy level, but on a, just an argumentation level. So from that con, what emerged was all these lines and zingers about the left and the culture. And you kind of wonder to what degree they think that generally shapes people's hearts and minds because if most people want something they're going to elect a government that's going to hopefully probably give them that thing and I'm not sure to what degree winning you know kind of virtual signaling on, on a stage about what I mean, real family is there are three, helps that there are three ways to look at the culture war in a way one of which is that it's a period of excess which will nonetheless die down and leave some good in its wake okay? yeah. which is a bit like the Victorian railway boom okay it kind of got out of hand but on the other hand <laughs> we did get some railways out of it yeah and even talking to, you know, what critics of it, like John Cleese, you know, one of the things I said is, we actually ought to look at this and say, right, they're Cleese. not wrong about everything, right? Yeah. And one of the things I said, you know, that right-wing people occasionally get cross about is trigger warnings. Yeah. Now, let's look at this. It's not interfering with anybody's ability to watch something, okay? The trigger warning merely says, which I think is a decent and, and honest and, and well-intentioned and good thing to do. Absolutely. Which is, let's say you are the victim of some particular atrocity in an, you know, an earlier part of your life, and that exposure to this sort of thing is deeply distressing. Well, we would like to save you that distress. Well, perfectly good. I, do, I find them slightly weird, actually, on Netflix, because they'll put things like, which in, in my childhood was absolutely routine, tobacco smoking is there <laughs> as a kind of trigger warning. But, I mean, maybe that's a good idea. If you have yeah. a real problem, you know, quitting smoking, maybe you shouldn't watch Casablanca. Yeah. You know, but but we shouldn't get you know, we shouldn't get annoyed at everything. A, a lot of it's well-intentioned, by the way. I mean, well-intentioned things aren't always good because yeah. when you want to signal that you care about a problem, you always tackle it head on. Whereas if you want to solve a problem, you quite often tackle it obliquely. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, so I also think a lot of it borrows things from the US and imports them wholesale to the UK when they're just not the same. Yeah. Okay? And we had a discussion about this actually at work about, you know, now obviously you can ask the question, where are you from? 
okay, um, in a way that's deeply offensive. And if reported in print, it will look deeply offensive, okay? But at some level, you know, if I work with someone for five years, okay, wanting to know whether they're from Antigua or Jamaica is just reasonable curiosity, yeah. okay? okay? It would be weirdly incurious of me to have... You know, just as I want to find out whether someone was from New Zealand not Austra or Australia, right? Okay, it's just part of natural curiosity which people ask about. Do you know what I think we've lost is is assuming the best of people's intentions. I think it's what's lost mm. here because the trigger warning thing. It's, it's, you're totally right. I mean, I remember when I first asked, when I first found out about trigger warnings, my initial thing was like, this is not that deep, as it were. It's not. Mm. It's not that serious. But then, as I thought about it deeper, I thought, well, yeah, if you if you've been exposed mm. to some, you know, it's oh, yeah. it's, it's yeah. reasonable. But what people do is that old logical fallacy. I, I remember studying this in uni. I think it's called a reductio ad absurdum, mm. when you take an idea and you stretch it to it's kind of like the yeah. craziest level, and you go, see how dumb it is. You like, mm. yeah, but that's not what. So obviously, what I'm talking about, and you see commentators on news shows like, we're gonna have a warning for everything and you're like that's not what we're talking about here same way as the if you're asking me in the office where are you from yeah. well if it's if it's a jolly sort of where are you from and i'm like oh southeast london yeah. you're like like where your parents from or where, you, where you're originally from and i answer that that's very different to someone going where you really where, where are you from from or where yeah, yeah, with yeah, a kind yeah. of yeah. With almost yeah. like a sneering uh interest that, that that feels almost um invasive in a sense but it, but i've got to be able to when the person asks me where am i from pay them some sort of some good will and say they maybe they're just curious and I, th I, th I think and I think the context is probably what's really important because as you said we're working for five years we get along we're just mm. having a conversation that I probably ask the same question that's very different to someone like what happened when the woman met uh, the royal family at uh, that yes. time and yeah. was asked sort of where are you from she was like and she kind of repeated multiple times I think South London or I think she London. was in her 80s I would have let her off yeah but, you know it's just you know but, but you get know, the gist but, that, but that's a slightly different context You're yeah. like you don't know who I am I mean, I've, I've kind of answered you once. You come in to ask her three it was times. A, it was a bit weird when you delved into it because she was, if I'm right, she was actually from the Caribbean. Yeah, but she was wearing the dishy or something. Or or okay, so who am I? <laughs> Most things are complex and nuanced, Most right? To, to, to the point yeah. we had, the yeah. conversation we had off air, you know. Um, no, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that was true, actually. I remember being like, why is she wearing the. But whatever. Yeah, <laughs> no, 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 exactly. And um, uh, I mean, you know, and. and um, uh, you know, I, I, th I think there's an element to it which is kind of, I think, an element of white people basically picking fights with other white people and uh, co-opting people of colour, uh, you know, without their necessary, <laughs> necessary consent or agreement, <laughs> as if these people automatically agree with them is yeah. also insulting because it's infantilising in a sense. Mm. You know, the very phrase, the so-and-so community... Right, it's kind of weird, like because no one would say, you know, the Kent community, <laughs> as if we were politically kind of. Hey there, just want to say thank you for listening or for watching uh, this podcast. Uh, we have a great desire to grow this podcast, and one of the ways we're going to do that is if you listening uh, follow, or if you are watching, you subscribe to the podcast. The faster it grows, um, the more guests we can get but also the better the podcast guests. So please just do me a favor, hit the subscribe button or the follow button. Um, back to the episode. Completely homogeneous, you know. Lovers of the uh, greenery. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, so, so um, you know, I think there is an element to it. Mm. Uh, personally, okay, you could look at it as kind of like the railway boom where some good comes of it and then, you know, it goes away. I think that maybe the writer right to be paranoid about certain aspects of it, which is making things beyond discussion or consideration or calling people racist for things which obviously aren't, mm. right? You know, I think that's, you know... Um, I mean, for, for instance... You know, there was. I'm not saying it was a large. I'm not saying it was a large group of people, but there was a significant group of people who voted for Brexit because they thought it was unfair that Europeans could swan in and people from Commonwealth countries couldn't. Mm. You know, not an unreasonable objection to it, by the way. I mean, if, you know, if you yeah. want to be honest, you know, if you if you're going to have any kind of managed immigration policy of some kind with some form of management, then some sort of equity yeah. wouldn't seem to be a ridiculous thing to include, right? Yeah. Um, and um, uh, I also think, 
I mean, I'm old enough to have seen it before. So the late 80s, early 90s saw a thing which was called political correctness, which we tend not to use anymore. And it kind of reached a height and died. And one of the reasons these things, I mean, you know, I mean, uh, the, you know, these things don't necessarily, OK, go on getting worse and worse. What often happens is they're actually subject to fashion. And actually, you know, if, if one's to be brutal, it's a movement which hasn't produced any music or poetry or, you know, it's, <laughs> it, it's not, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, Soviet communism, you know, produced a whole load of theatre and some quite interesting things. It, it, it seems to be very dry and academic and absolutist, and I suspect will, A, never take off en masse, even among the people it's often purporting to support, by the yeah. way, whose opinions are much more complicated and variegated than we admit. Um, uh, it's, it's just the extreme, because extre there's a point about we all should be more editorial in terms of how we speak, which just means think a bit more, mm. choose the right word. Nothing wrong with that. I, I, I think that's a good thing for us oh, not to... One, one, thing, one thing which I've benefited from personally yeah. is spending some time thinking about things in other people's shoes, right? This is it. So as a kind of... Uh, this posh sounding English person, even though I'm part Scottish, right? I would feel unease going around parts of Glasgow on a Saturday night, right? Yeah. Okay. And suddenly imagining what it was like to feel that all the time, mm. okay? Mm. That's an enlightening thing. I mean, by the way, you know, I mean, uh, I don't f for a second agree with them, but I think it's worth trying to understand the ro Russian motivation, whether it is a Russian motivation or purely a kind of Putin you know, kind of weird, apocalyptic... Um, messianic. Messianic sort of thing. thing. I don't yeah. know, OK? But it's worth trying to understand that, at the very least, OK? And not all of it's bad, not all of it's well-intentioned. Some of it may be well-intentioned and have good consequences. Some of it, as is true of all well-intentioned things, actually. Yeah. They tend to have a mixed mixed result. But um, uh, I, 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 I wonder if the right is... Uh, um, uh, is is right to get angry about certain things. Like, effectively, I think it is fair to say, OK, let's give an example to this, um, that me... Um, and uh, I think this, again, is both Jonathan Haidt and Robert Cialdini, two very good writers. Most media bias isn't actually what you say, it's what you talk about and what you don't talk about. Yeah. OK. And so closing off areas completely for discussion on the grounds that it's unacceptable to talk about migration, for example, mm. is not a healthy thing to do. It's not a reasonable thing to do, and it's biased. Because if you look at, you know, large swathes of the population, including the pop, you know, populations of, of people who have come here voluntarily, OK, they want it discussed and they want it controlled, mm. OK? And so it's so that business where undoubtedly the press sort of middle class life has made certain subjects kind of untouchable is not a healthy state of affairs. You know, when people say this, I do always wonder though, Rory, like, again, it might be maybe the, the work I do, I'm always talking to people, but that, I, I feel like there aren't many topics that I feel like are out of bounds or like, like um, as an as an immigration, for instance, is discussed. Ad nauseum. Like, I hear it all the time. And, and it's odd, because now there's a second secondary conversation, which is how much we're not allowed to talk about immigration, <laughs> which is also now another conversation no, no, yeah, yeah, I absolutely, hear all the time. Yeah. So I, I do kind of wonder what topics people aren't allowed to talk about, especially I, when... I, I, th I think the reaction's a mixture of right-wing paranoia um, <laughs> combined with, actually, some, sen some perfectly sensible observations that what you're attempting to do is essentially to discredit uh, all kind of uh, any, mm. any past achievement, OK? Got you. you know, so, you know, I, I think that business, you know, uh, yeah, I get, I get it, OK, I get the background, but attacking Winston Churchill statues okay. is kind of something which actually, I mean, quite a lot of people of colour would be, I, I imagine, pretty dis discomforted oh, by. God. So right? sorry about this. <laughs> And what you're what you're attempting to do is effectively attempting to do what mm. Pol Pot did, which is declare a kind of year zero, and nothing that was done beforehand was of any merit or value because the people who did it were insufficiently enlightened. Yeah, I agree with you. I think I, th I think how we think about the past figures we spoke about before, critically appraising people, balancing things properly mm. about that that I totally agree with. That we need to do that better. Some of the heroes we have right now 
probably shouldn't be as high as we have them, and some people we have maybe well, lost them be as high. Also, they've stolen a narrative which is that basically everybody in the 18th century was a moronic bastard, okay? Yeah. And then gradually left wings to people started appearing who made things nice and intelligent, <laughs> okay? And then you look at the real history and you realize that. Uh, um, Almost nobody knows about the effort to prevent the slave trade undertaken by the Royal Navy in the 19th century. Amistad is a very interesting film for that, from that point of view. Okay, But we should know about that because that was a heroic effort and deserves uh, adding to the credit balance in kind of our national double entry bookkeeping. Yeah. Okay? Right. And the fact that, you know... Um, uh, now, actually, OK, votes for women first introduced under a Conservative government, OK? One of the, the very first people to look at decriminalisation of homosexuality who are generally first to the party, religion is generally viewed as being on the bad side, OK? And yet it was the Quakers who are probably the first people to look at it. The Archbishop of Canterbury for a time needed personal protection in the 1960s because he favoured the decriminalisation of homosexuality, OK? Um, in some cases, it was churches that led this the Spectator, right-wing publication known as the Buggers Bugle in the 60s for advocating the same discriminalisation. Spectator supports the Union in the Civil War, about the only British publication to do so. Guardian supports the Confederacy, ties to the Manchester cotton trade, OK? And if you, if you dig back deeply enough, the progress, which is entirely attributed in this narrative to one very narrow group of people, generally people who go on protests, by yeah. the way, because that's, that's, um, uh, that's what you might call the gateway drug. To, yeah. you know. <laughs> OK. OK. No, those people are hijacking, actually, a whole much more nuanced, much more complicated narrative yeah. of progress, which um, uh, is... Uh, and also, they're also, I think, imposing what you might call American guilt on the UK to an unpleasant extent, OK? Now, I, I didn't know what this was like. I was fascinated. I had a great aunt who's... Um, I only met her once. She was an anthropologist. And um, uh, she was a, you know, conventional... Uh, white woman, middle-class woman, uh, admittedly being an anthropologist uh, of the time. And as part of her travels, she went to, let me get this right, Nashville in the 1920s, OK? Mm -hmm. And I had her papers. I, I it'll be interesting to see how she reacts to this, OK? You know, you know the general racism. Yeah. Now, I assumed her reaction would be, gosh, this really is a bit racist, OK? You know, I'm, I'm not really, you know, gosh, this really is a bit strange. She was absolutely horrified. I mean, literally aghast, mm. OK? Right? And so she, she realised that she, as an anthropologist, couldn't interview black families. They were frightened to invite her into their home because if word got around that a white woman had been in their home, people would accuse them of causing trouble and basically go and beat them up, OK? And that was how extreme it was. Oh, now, wow. I... With it... OK, OK. I'd like to think that we were never quite that bad, partly because one great advantage of having a class system, OK, <laughs> is it gives you something else to discriminate yeah. on. OK. And there was, by the way, there was an element of that, yeah. OK, you know, that you had, you know, it was acknowledged that, you know, if you're a king in Africa, you were a king, OK. Um, now, so there is that attempt to effectively eradicate all the contribution of and that is a highly you know, that's a highly unconservative thing because conservatism you know draws draws pleasure from past achievement yeah and patriotism's not that weird is it anthropologically right i mean no. compared to football okay patriotism is actually pretty sane yeah well i mean now it's it's uh it's not so cool I mean, the most, especially for the UK, I think the most, what would have been a high point for, for kind of, you know, nationalist expression, the coronation. Yeah. For a lot of people, watched it online, bit weird, but kind of, kind of, kind of interested and then moved on. I mean, to, to wait, not, wait, to think, not, think about to how not the coronation years like ago. like demolishing an ancient building though, wouldn't it? I mean, it's what you know, we no, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not yeah. saying it shouldn't have happened. Yeah. I'm just saying mm. the reactions to it, you know, if you fast, if you went back a hundred years, say, I mean, the coronation would have probably, I mean, it, it, the whole country, I think, would have been on the streets just like, this is the greatest thing ever. Whereas now, most young people I spoke to about the coronation were like, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, cool. 
You know, but, but yeah, no, no, absolutely. I mean, e- I, even though there was something about there was a majesty of two, yeah, to it. Yeah. You know, when I watched that, I, I do remember being like, "Wow, this is this is really something." I didn't know what it was. I couldn't. No, no, I, 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 couldn't, I, I, couldn't was, I didn't have the words. But I remember I, I mean, like this is something. There were elements of Monty Python. There were elements of kind of Game of Thrones. I mean, it was kind of <laughs> it, it was kind of extraordinary because of course you know nearly everybody under the age of about seventy eight or something, eighty something, hasn't seen one. Yeah. Okay. Before, and uh, it was kind of extraordinary. Um, but that that focus on continuity, by the way, is probably a conservative instinct which is kind of right, which is the urge to reinvent things uh, from scratch based on theory is probably an instinct that's wrong. In other words, there's a friend of mine who's written a business book called Start With What Works. Yeah. And one of the things he, he argues about, okay, is that there's a tendency in businesses, even businesses that are doing really well and are really successful, to take one or two metrics that are a bit disappointing and start agonizing about them. And, you know, or get really, really angry about the one or two things that aren't working very well. And he argues that that's a wrong framing, that what you should do is actually start with what is working and do more of it. Yeah. Okay. Now, I remember having a conversation about this where people, it was, I'm I'm trying to remember the period, but it it was sometime about 10 years ago, where people were... um, basically going on to this absolute rant about how bad the UK was and how this didn't work and this didn't work. And there was a guy, and I won't name it, okay, from another nearby European country, okay, who just stood up and said, are you guys crazy? He says, <laughs> because he said, where I come from, we'd actually kill to have the kind of trivial problems you do. Yeah. <laughs> now, you know, there's a very large part to the UK which really, really works, okay? Now... Um, Height and various other people who um, Matthew Syed is another one. I don't know if you heard him as yeah, a guest. Uh, no, but I, I want to. I'll, put ex, you in touch, okay. oh, I'll be great. Ex table 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 tennis player, right? So, uh, uh, ex UK table tennis. Yeah, I used to play table tennis, so that's how I, I got to know him. Scientist. He makes the same point that he says that the reason he's moved politically to the right as you get older. One reason, by the way, I think you move right way, You move rightwards as you get older is very boring, but it's nonetheless worth noting. Okay, um, problems. And news are fast. Bad news is fast. Good news is slow. Okay. Mm. Most improvements to things don't happen overnight. They don't happen simultaneously. They may happen very unequally. Yeah. I mean, okay, in the early days of the car, now I'm not suggesting we have universal car ownership. I'm not suggesting there is an inequality. There is an inequality of access. But if you can imagine what it was like in the very early days of the car, where it was basically rich person's plaything. Yeah. Okay. You know, you can imagine what a kind of debate that caused in the US. Mm. Now, what Syed said is so, so as you get older, you notice more things getting better. Right? Yeah, trivial things, you know, hotels are a lot better. <laughs> um, actually, the, um, I would say, I would say um, uh, undoubtedly, for example, certain forms of prejudice are diminished. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I think we've got, by the way, I think we've got a perfectly reasonable aspiration, which is to look at places like Canada, which seem to work well, and do more of that. Okay, so so rather than always getting angry about what the problems are, take what's working well and do more of it. But that's harder work and it's slower than doing the opposite. Okay, and you know there are quite a lot of aspects of this place which I mean migration kind of proves it, right? Mm. I mean, why these people are already in France? Why are they so desperate to get here? Multiple reasons, by the way. Incidentally, by the way, there's an important thing which no white middle-class person ever considers about migrants, economic migrants, which is that they personally don't want to go. Hey there, just want to say thank you for listening or for watching uh, this podcast. Uh, We have a great desire to grow this podcast. And one of the ways we're going to do that is if you listening, uh, follow, or if you are watching, you subscribe to the podcast. The faster it grows, um, the more guests we can get but also the better the podcast guests. So please just do me a favor, hit the subscribe button or the follow button um, back to the episode. Right? Mm. Now, that's because uh, that kind of per- white person, if their parents told them to do law at university when they wanted to do contemporary dance, they'd go absolutely bananas and they'd go and study contemporary dance. Mm. A lot of those people come from a culture where you do what you're told, right? Now. How have these people aged 23 got together the 8,000 pounds or whatever necessary to make the trip, 
Okay? My hunch is that in some cases, families or extended families have kind of pooled resources to fund someone to go over to send the money back. Mm. Okay? That may mean that the person who's making the journey doesn't actually want to be doing that. Okay, we need, now, no one has ever mentioned that as a potential problem. Yeah, well, okay. I, I suppose we've never had kind of the opportunity to probably sit down, uh, interview, and have, a proper, have a proper conversation about what, and stuff what is like actually that. happening there. You know. yeah. but, but, I mean, a more nuanced understanding of what's going on is pretty helpful. But, but Haidt and Syed both say that um, th- the, reason they, um, uh, the reason they moved right is that they thought the right was was correct about one thing, which is that thing that the left tends to assume that kind of civilization will continue regardless and that you can mess around with it as much as you like because civilization is robust. Okay. <laughs> and the right tend to take the view that, you know, possibly equally pessimistic, biased in the same way, but nonetheless fundamentally right, that these things can collapse very, very quickly. Yeah. There are loads and loads of cultures which have gone from, you know, uh, you know, uh, total civilization to basically, I mean, you've got to include the U.S. in this, you know, in 30 years' time, that have gone from kind of absolute what seems like automatic functioning, they work, they can only work, and they're going to keep on working better, to a kind of, uh, you know, catastrophe. Yeah. And so the protection of institutions, the protection of traditions and habits... Uh, which is anathema to a left-wing mind, is work that needs to be done by somebody. It's fascinating you say that, because in America, it's the far right that stormed the, tra- the capital. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the folks who are meant to be about I continuity, know. keeping order, respect for cherished institutions, are the folks who, who stormed the capital. <laughs> and, he, and, he, and essentially, I think, what, four or five police officers died? So, so you'd, you'd think, it seems as though, I think, left and the right... The idea of a right-wing Brit attacking a cop. <laughs> OK, I, I've, got to try, I've got to try to imagine, OK? I mean, I'm sure it has happened, OK? There must have been some... I mean, I mean you have sort of fascist groups where you think about the Nationalist Front, you think about, um, you think about uh, um, the National Front, rather, uh, Britain First as well, you think about... Um, it's funny. My my undergraduate, uh, my master's thesis. No, my undergraduate thesis was on right wing part, right right wing parties across Europe. I just find them so fascinating. But they're but, very different, aren't they? And this is the other thing which I think NatCon will have trouble with, which is finding cohesion among these groups. Exactly, especially um, the fringe groups, because you when you get to the fringe sort of ethno nationalist sort of s- yeah. space, um, it's 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 interesting because xenophobia and racism are. They're kind of bedfellows in, a, in an odd type of way, in that it's it's all the bedrock or the similar strain they share is the kind of fear of the unknown, which yeah. is kind of fever. It's kind of dialed up to like a sort of existential threat. This notion that there's a you, know, you start seeing language like swarm and and all these other sort of things used about about immigration, which for me I think is totally out of whack. Especially when you look at the numbers, it's 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 not this crazy, you know. No. Uh, leap that that would lead us to kind of go there's a swarm happening but then the the language isn't too dissimilar to what folks like at the national front or when you think about what's that guy's name tommy robinson and back in these days he used to talk about muslims coming to this country and it being some sort of swarm we're being attacked where you know it's it's it, there's no space all these sort of I language mean, that you'd go ah i suppose you're not sure there tommy if you see it from a, from a right-wing point of view, of course, there is the idea that if the Conservative government uh, let in a million... Let's say that South Africa blew up, right? And the Conservative <laughs> government let in a million white South Africans of British ancestry, OK? Yeah. Then the left will go, hold on, these people are going to vote, OK? And we can guess which way they might vote. Yeah. OK. And there is that, there is that slight thing, which is your... Met, you know, Keir Starmer's plan that EU citizens can vote in... British national elections. That's wild. There is. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. EU citizens in the in the UK. In the UK. Oh, yeah, gosh, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. yeah. That that's that's a bit weird. Okay. So any attempt to tinker with an electorate. Mm. Okay. So you have you know you, so someone once put it. They said it's not the actual uh, people choosing the government. It's the government choosing the people. Yeah. So well, in America, that's certainly the case with Jeremy and all yeah. these sort of things. Although you start to see weird things like Latinos going right, uh, leaning going right wing. Latinos uh, for Latinos for Trump. <laughs> In the, in, the, in the UK, I think there are quite a few uh, uh, ethnic groups which are now uh, 
conservative, lean, yeah. lean conservative. Sikhs tend to be a bit 50 it, 50, Chinese tend to lean conservative. It's the, it's the culture thing. I think we yeah. spoke about it before. A lot of ethnic minorities are culturally conservative. Well, the funniest thing is that <laughs> I, when I went to the Conservative Party conference, the people there who are probably most venerated, yeah. okay at the conference are not actually necessarily the senior politicians. It's, say, yeah. the Sikh entrepreneurs. Yeah. And you have this very interesting thing. And, of course, we've got to look at this from, di- from varying economic standpoints, okay? yeah. because as a pretty prosperous person in the southeast of England, almost everything that gets better in my life is brought to me by someone who's immigrated. Mm. Okay? Now, it may be a Cypriot entrepreneur, it may be an Indian entrepreneur who started, you know, EasyJet, okay, right, okay. Right. I mean, the extent to which the contribution towards the entrepreneurial life of the country, which is what conservatives venerate, has yeah. been driven, undoubtedly, OK, uh, people who moved. Because I suspect in the development, uh, in the kind of uh, trajectory, OK, of any immigrant family, there's this period of entrepreneurialism. OK, yeah. now, look at my own family. OK, now, they're, they're, OK, I can't claim, OK, immigrant status entirely. Uh, they, um, the, 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 my... You're from Scotland, you say you're from Scotland, Emigrated right? from the north of Scotland to Wales, yeah. OK. Now, the pattern went, OK, digging peat in Croft, OK, um, great-grandfather moves down to Edinburgh intending to join the police force. Goes to some place in Edinburgh. People say, you're wasting your time here, mate. South Wales is where the money's being made. Now, I know that sounds weird, but Cardiff was like the Dubai of the 1890s, OK? <laughs> right? Okay. right? And it was the biggest uh, coal exporting port in the world. Right? That. <laughs> exactly, <yeah. laughs> first place, Cardiff, um, next to the docks, is the first place in the world where a million-pound transaction took place. So the first ever transaction signed for a million pounds or more was actually signed next what, to the was docks. The, was it was someone buying coal, sheep coal or something? Some massive coal deal. Oh, sorry, I thought yeah. someone was buying yeah. like a million sheep. Yeah. Yeah. A million <laughs> sheep. <laughs> <laughs> One pound um, a pop. He, he then gets a job in a shop. The shop is run by Scots. He's Scottish. They, to be honest, I think they only employed Scots. Yeah. Okay. He works in the shop, marries the daughter of the shopkeeper, ends up running a chain of shops. Sends mm. kids to medical school, right? So you have this trajectory where there's this kind of entrepreneurial uh, intersection between yeah, yeah, yeah. craving permanent respectability and, uh, you know, coming from peat digging. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I would have, you know, um, as someone who absolutely loves, you know, inventiveness in business, you know, I'd have to be completely blind not to acknowledge that contribution and to say that, of course, what's so peculiar is that conservatives really, really venerate it, actually, yeah. in a weird way. And you could say, by the way, that the left is, uh, uh, isn't sufficiently respectful of entrepreneurs, undoubtedly, and the role they play in the economy. Um, because its, its history has always been of collective groups. And, of yeah. course, the entrepreneurs, in a sense, the opposite of Very that. Very individualistic. Yeah. Well, I, it was, it's going to be fascinating to see what happens with, with this left and, and right tussle, especially... I keep saying it, I'm trying to be prophetic, but, but as, as the Conservatives enter a period of opposition, it will be really mm. fascinating to see what happens. But I love what you've said today about sort of... Uh, by the way, my, why you need my, both my point about media bias being what you talk about, OK? Yeah. If you'd had an, an overwhelmingly left-wing press, OK, and uh, there'd been a left-wing government during COVID, OK, uh, you could have written off those Downing Street parties as a bit of a laugh, right? By the way, it doesn't surprise me at all. I'm 57, I wouldn't have done that. When I was 35, if I'd been working in close proximity with a load of other people for 18 hours a day and it finally got to Friday, would I have got blatted? Of course I would have done. Yeah, but, but Boris Johnson, he wasn't 35, was he? Well, I mean, the, the, the senior people were <laughs> condoned rather than participated. Yeah. I also think there's some very, very weird... I mean, my contention about... It, 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 there's a great line in Citizen Kane where uh, <laughs> Kane says, um, make the headline big enough and I'll make the story big enough. Hmm. So by putting something on the front page and making a big deal, had Nixon been a Democrat, I've always had this vague suspicion that Watergate would have been on, like, page seven and it would have been treated by journalists as, you know, oh, they broke into the headquarters. Yeah. What a guy. Oh, well. oh, the naughty boys. Right? <laughs> and if you left, left that on page seven, right, yeah. you could have basically avoided the whole thing. OK? So the extent to which what's imp- I didn't understand, I still don't understand, what was egregious about um, Don Cummings's trip to 
Um, to Barnard Castle. To Bar- I think. <laughs> well, no, no, that one was a bit weird. Um, the point. Well, of, to the test point his I'm eyesight. Is the only thing I felt a bit sorry for was massive northern prejudice because had his <laughs> had his parents lived in Surbiton, right? No one would have actually raised an eyebrow at all, right? Well, I, I think the bigger issue there was the double standard and the fact that he lied to the whole country, and and Boris Johnson knew about it, and it was such a st- stupid lie but, that was so okay, obviously uh, not uh, true. Uh, but it, but but uh, he, uh, he he. Thinks he th- I think also what really annoyed me, if I'm honest, what enraged me the most was he thought somehow we were like stupid enough and we would go, oh yeah, that's totally fine. And not be like, mate, we, I, I would love to see my mum, you know, and, and, and I can't. And you're, okay. And you- <laughs> okay, but, okay, but then, then you get this awkward trick, right? Which yeah. is someone goes, okay, and this is, this is where the press undoubtedly plays. There's a book by Paul Bloom, who's the professor of... Um, uh, psychology at Yale, and his book's called Against Empathy. Mm. Okay, and I think the extent to which TV news, okay, can construct an unrebut. Uh, okay, I, uh, I can't tell the specific story because it was told me under confidence. Um, but it's but a, a story you okay, can't refute. Some, someone who supported a particular policy, which on balance is probably a good policy, okay, uh, was invited to appear. I can't. I can't give the specifics without asking this guy's permission. Yeah. Was invited to appear on something like Good Morning Britain, okay, uh, to defend this policy and to explain it, which he okay. supports. Which he supports. Yeah. Okay. It, it's to do with road traffic. Okay. okay. Now, um, he comes. Who's the other guest on the program? Is it someone who's also a traffic expert who opposes the policy? No, it's someone whose husband died in an accident. Yeah. Okay. Now, that is not a fair argument, right? Because you can't go in hard on someone with a hard luck story, okay? Now, if you're being absolutely brutal and rationalistic about it, okay, and you, and you say, you, you do a story about the Downing Street parties and you bring someone on who says, I wasn't even allowed to see my dying father in hospital, okay? Uh, or my father's funeral could only be attended by five people because, right? Now, it, Norman Tebbit would probably, the late Norman Tebbit would probably have said this. If you're a real Rottweiler, you don't care, right? And you just say, the reason for that is they're completely different conditions, okay? One of them is a load of people working in the same place who add alcohol to the occasion, which is, irre- oh, sorry about this, I banged the microphone, uh, which is irrelevant to the spread of the disease. Yeah. The other one is a funeral where lots of people from different places all come together and, and for two hours sing and, and breathe yeah. a lot and, and, and occupy a shared space before then going back to lots of different places, yeah. okay? That is a massive potential super spreader no I, no I totally agree I, th- no, I think I you think can't if, say that someone who's, whose relatives die of course okay. but also now that, uh, that, that way when, in which uh, the, one of the things that annoys me about press coverage is the left mm. the, the sort of journalists are rational when they want to be rational and they're emotional when it suits them okay now I think that's uh, where I talk about against empathy sometimes yeah. empathy it sounds a really weird title for a book but sometimes empathy causes us to make really really dubious decisions now okay this is a hyper rationalist policy okay but it's the policy adopted by Norway I think okay which is they unlike the Swedes Okay, they believe the Swedes have accepted a lot of migrants because they're guilty about what Sweden did in World War Two, which was basically let the Germans through to invade Norway. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but, lost all my Swedish friends there. Um, but um, their argument was, if we look at how you actually make a difference, okay, right? We don't look at a photograph of, of someone who's in a boat in a. In, in, a, in a life draft, we actually asked the question, how can we really make a difference? Well, the Norwegians have the advantage of being very, very rich, but they said, we can make 14 times as much difference by funding camps for refugees outside the borders of a war-torn country, okay? That makes 14 times more difference to human well-being net, both by scale and degree, than taking a small subsection of this population awarding them uh, uh, you know, so residency in Norway yeah. and ignoring everybody else. Now, it's worth noting the people who turn up and try and cross the channel are visible. The people who are stuck in some camp are 
50 times more numerous and arguably in a worse state of affairs because they're in some migrant camp. They're not in France. Now, I agree. I mean, I escaped from France. Can't get a cooked breakfast. I mean, there are lots of reasons why you'd make that journey, OK? But the point I'm making is that you could make that point from a purely utilitarian standpoint, yeah. that the real fuss should not be, wow, I want to make myself look generous by saying we should let people in. The real fuss should be made saying, why aren't we funding aid adequately enough yeah. to the people who are most numerous and most adversely affected. Yeah. And so what you might call it, it's, it's what you might call, OK, boy trapped in well is mm. the problem of, of empathy. Which is, it's a situation we can all relate to, if you, literally, if you get a body. No, no I, mean, well. that, I totally agree. I, I, I agree with, with all of that. I think um, the, the difficulty with, with, uh, with the, um, it's funny, I just saw Matt Hancock on um, the news agents sort of talking about, he, he was like, so fascinating. He's very interesting for he's, a number of reasons. Guy, but like, he, 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 his, here's what he said on the, on the news agents. They asked him, you know, should you have done this? You know, kind of the same old questions about everything. And he's like, I'm a human. He's like, I'm a human, okay? And I've explained myself, and I'm a human. And I thought, well, mate, you didn't have to do this job. He, he was getting annoyed at people kind of asking him the question over and over again. And, and this is the problem I have when folks go, I'm happy to take the kind of benefits of being a public figure, say, but any other kind of, any other sort of handicap, say, that comes, for, for instance, being continually asked about something, that's a red line. So, so, so with Dominic Commons, what should he have done? Well, resign gracefully. Say, you know what? I made a mistake. Uh, I, I shouldn't have done okay. it. Uh, uh, I'm off. This is why he I tried to stay. Okay. So <laughs> for from months. The, from the point of view of a decision scientist. Yeah. I think what he did was right, actually. Because Who's just staying? No, no, going up, to, going up to Durham was the right thing to do. Right, okay, so he had a what? First of all, his position is not exactly the same as everybody else's because there is a security aspect to it. Yeah. He's, a very, he's a public figure. But also, okay. this is his crafted story that he told us um, right. in front of the cameras. Um, so there may be an element to the story he's not willing to tell, by the way, because he thinks it's private to his family. I don't sure. know about that. So we ought to be cognizant of that. Um, and his question is, what do I do? If I bring someone into the flat, I'm, I'm contaminating somebody, right? Yeah. Okay. I can't bring someone into the flat. I may have to work very long hours, and I can't do my job if I know that my wife and children are Ill, child is ill, and I can't look after them. Now, all I'm saying is, if that was been an NHS, okay, if that had been an NHS surgeon, thoracic surgeon, making that decision, no one would have given them a hard time. Now, everybody says, but the thoracic surgeons don't make the rules. Nonetheless, you would have accepted it. Okay, I know. OK, just on Partygate, there was one NHS hospital. You're not allowed to drink in certain... I don't know what the rules are on drinking in the NHS, but basically you can't get rat assed inside a hospital. I get it. There was one NHS hospital who, during COVID, had a double-decker bus outside the grounds so people on their way home could basically get blitzed. OK? Because if you're working very, very hard and you've been working very, very hard for a long time and you're not 57 like me where your hangovers last two fucking days, OK, you have a very strong urge on Friday evening or whatever it is to... You know, it's how you relax fast. Yeah. Okay. You're in a very, very tense situation. Booze has lots and lots of vices, lots and lots of failings, but it does help you actually switch off fast. Yeah. See, okay. I, I would accept that from any other office if it wasn't number 10 down in the street. Well, maybe, I, I just think it's so different because no, 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 you're, le I, you're the I, leaders I, I, of the country. It's just yeah, not the same. Well, the, the human point, I, I'm going to make another very weird defense, which is that I have a, I've always had a suspicion Okay, actually, a lot of people who work in advertising, which is, um, uh, you know, always seen as a sort of dissolute business, are actually, mm -hmm. you know, devoted family people who go home to their children and look after them. Do not philander, take drugs, or anything else. Okay, right. And I've always had this mischievous theory that if you're either a politician or you're, for example, a televangelist in the U.S., okay, <laughs> the element of risk makes transgression five times more enjoyable. Right? Because <laughs> if you work in advertising and you're caught in a motel room with a girl called Tammy, OK, it's mildly embarrassing, but it doesn't, it doesn't damage your career at all. It wouldn't affect your career, right? Yeah. Now, the very element of risk must make, that fan must make philandering for politicians fantastically enjoyable in a way it isn't for ordinary mortals. Yeah. OK. I had a friend who worked in the music industry. Um, I had a friend who worked in the music industry for years, and... The most horrified he's ever been by debauched behaviour was when he attended the Christmas party at his brother-in-law's firm. 
His brother-in-law's firm was a provincial accountancy firm. Oh, gosh. And he said, I've never seen debauchery like it because it's the one time in the year, OK? If you're in the music industry, right, you've got a chance to basically blitz off fairly frequently. Okay? Yeah. It was rather the same, wasn't it, which is that the, when, in the early days of punk, there was always much more violence at the provincial concerts than yeah. the London ones because everybody felt they had to outdo <coughs> London, you know? And so I've always had this mischievous thing that actually the politicians are exposed to slightly more temptation simply yeah. because that kind of thing is much more... It's rather like the... Um, I think it was Maurice Bowerer who always argued that the fun went out of homosexuality when they legalised it. I mean, OK, <laughs> no. I'm not suggesting that's a mainstream <laughs> argument, but he was something like the provost of all souls. Argument. Yeah. And the argument being that something that is actually transgressive and has... No, no I, I, I buy it. Um, but no, OK, I, from a decision I, I, science I point of view, that. there is this redundant building, OK? It's more like a shed. It's not some, you know, weird palace, OK? In Durham, to where you can deposit your wife and daughter... And then the intention is drive back to London. He got COVID, so he ended up staying there for a week. The intention was drop them off, drive back, OK? The drive, assuming he used the petrol apps, needn't have exposed him to anybody else, OK? The car was effectively a closed thing, Yeah. OK? Um, now, the, the, the reason I argue with my wife is that Dom is quite a good devotee of behavioural science and decision science, and I study those areas. And in his defence... I can't see anything else he could have done that wouldn't have risked contaminating somebody else. Wasn't, his, wasn't that also his wife's birthday? Uh, the Barnard Castle was his wife's yeah. birthday. And that was, to be absolutely honest, a jolly. I, I, I would have... I would have <laughs> okay, come, good. No, no, so no, we're... I'm not, I'm not, no, no, I'm not okay. defending that. Okay, I cool. mean, we, we, all, we, all, we all went on five mile... Uh, we all went on five mile drives and had a walk. We didn't go that far. Yeah. Uh, he <laughs> should have told a much better story, by the way, which um, if you, you, this is why if you want to make up a story, you need a professional like me, not an amateur, OK? <laughs> He had a Land Rover, OK? <laughs> Anybody who has a ja Jaguar Land Rover vehicle knows that if you don't drive them for 10 days, the battery goes flat, mm. OK? If he'd only said, OK, I needed to go on a short drive to recharge the car battery because it was really flat, every single Jaguar Land Rover driver in the country would have said, yeah, he's right. <laughs> right? You didn't have enough time yeah, to contract his story. Just, I know Dom, I like him. I also think he had the really interesting idea, which he never used, which was vapours for Brexit, OK? Oh, no. Uh, for the campaign. <laughs> <laughs> OK, but um, the one thing he did, which was, to my mind, absolutely bizarre and ridiculous, OK, compared to the trip to Durham, compared to the trip to Barnard Castle, mm. the thing he did, which was utterly crazy and absurd, OK, which I cannot understand at all, right? If you look at his, effectively, his, part, his pattern of movements, is he went straight from a flat where his wife and child were ill with COVID into Number 10 Downing Street. Mm. Now, not... Our journalists, they've all got fucking PPE degrees from Oxford. Not a single journalist picked up on that as the most ridiculous thing. There you are. So, funnily enough, in the very beginnings of COVID, they wanted me to attend some meeting in 10 Downing Street just to give a small amount of advice. And I'd just come back from Northern Italy. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't want to be patient zero. Uh, and so I ended, up, um, I ended up phoning in from a McDonald's car park. Oh, okay. gosh. Interesting, by the way, tiny detail... Uh, at the time to show how weird things are technologically. My request for a speakerphone within 10 Downing Street was clearly viewed as a bit of an egregious request at the time. Okay, <laughs> what? I, I, I expect we can find one. Okay, right. so again, this is the centre of fucking government. I mean, you should, we imagine, okay, it's like CSI, you know, there's, <laughs> I don't know CSI, what's it called, 24? Yeah. yeah. What, was, what was that thing called? With the, lots the, of, um, the, 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 CT, CTU, wasn't it, in, in CSI? I don't remember, but in, in I know, I'd see the, I see the picture. Loads of massive screens, yeah, yeah. okay. By the way, on those massive screens, I have to give an absolute heads up to my cousin, Eddie Baton, who I think became conscious or regained consciousness halfway through a colonoscopy and looked up and said, either I'm dead or this is the world's worst sports bar. <laughs> 55-inch <laughs> sort of 4K screens all showing the inside of the <laughs> Um, anyway, the, um, <laughs> but, but that decision, what was so weird is they have this meeting in the Rose Garden. Yeah. One after the other, questioning him on this emotional question of it's not fair. Yeah. Right? Well, it's not fair, but he's more important than me. 
And I, as a Conservative, I'm willing to say, you know, there are people, police people, medical people, OK, who are much more important than me. I'm just an advertising person, and I think they can break the rules that I don't. Okay? Yeah, I, I don't think people okay, would now, extend now, that to I know to, most people don't understand that, but that's my personal position, you know, that, you know, just as ambulances go through red traffic lights, I think there is a certain leeway you give to people in exceptional circumstances, OK? I don't really believe in no-context legislation. I mean, that's not what legislation's for. Um, you know, you have to look at the intent of the law as well as the letter of the law and so on. But um, what I found extraordinary about our journalistic class is every single person picked up on this, ooh, it's not fair, you went to your parents in Durham, OK? The fact that he walked from an infected flat to... 10 Downing Street, with the risk of creating some sort of super spreader event and knocking out the entire operation, wasn't picked up by a single journalist. Yeah. Now, that's what I mean about the fact that bias doesn't necessarily arise from how you talk about things. It arises from whether you talk about something and whether you don't. Yeah. And the emphasis to which you give it. But I, su I suspect they could have known about it, but they decided not to, because, again, the, the biggest issue about that was the semen double standard that we now, looking back, know pretty much around throughout number 10 down the street yeah, at that time you're, very, you're and, very close to my wife in terms of your moral um, well no but here's this, my point no, my, I, wife, my wife's exactly like that she yeah, goes but those are the rules you obey the rules and i go nah no no but, know, but here's yeah. the thing like I, i'm not saying See, this, is, this, this, is, this is this is actually accept of mine my personal my personal gripe with that whole thing was the fact was how stupid he thought the British public was in thinking I'll just tell the story and we'll just go oh Dom it must be right and we'll just leave him that, that's what annoyed me I thought this is the best you can say and the fact that he wouldn't resign and I, I that's kind of got me annoyed recently where there was a there was a period where if you, you make a blunder mm. you're gone but we now have these folks who think they're sort of larger than life, maverick figures. I'm gonna kind of kind of change the way government's done. I'm Mr. Brexit over here. That sort of thing of I can do whatever I well, want. We, that equally, really equally, got, that, it, that annoys me it, at the deepest level. If I'm honest, equally, are we creating a world? So, for example, that poor guy who's the labor, very young Labour MP for Sheffield, who you know. Uh, ended up contending with mental health issues. Okay. Now, at, it was revealed that at the age of 17, way before he went into politics, he published one or two slightly dodgy tweets, right? I mean, he wasn't even an ad full adult at the time, OK? And that was considered, you know, enough to end the... Now, I mean, um, there may have been loads of other reasons that they knew about which I didn't. All I'm saying is we're in danger of creating a world where no one can go into politics. I mean, Winston Churchill was, let's be honest, a high-functioning alcoholic throughout no, World but War I think II, that's, right? But... OK? Um, uh, you know, very high functioning, but you know, I don't think you can. Dispute <laughs> I take the your point, one. but the, but don't you think that goes back to the reductio ad absurdum point, which is, yeah, absolutely. I think someone who tweeted something when they were sixteen is clearly ridiculous to say that's that's a disqualifying thing. Yeah, but parties getting breaking the law. I mean, Rishi Sunak literally has was fined by the by the police like these sort of things i think this is uncharted territory we're in we must kind of and i think it's trump that's made people sort of get to a stage let, where it's let, like let, let, oh let, it doesn't matter I do, if you've I got do, like I sexual assault think, charges I mean, you know it's, it's, just, it's it, complicated <laughs> because i don't i think you've got to write laws heuristically so that everyone yeah. can obey them um which probably means there is always so a, com a really complicated one which i find really interesting is um uh, when you write a law that goes contrary to instinct, yeah, okay, it's a bit complicated. Let me get, let me give an example of this. I have no idea whether the people who had to go into the Ogilvy offices, my employer, uh, during COVID, whether when it came to Friday they had a, a few drinks. You know, uh, I know they didn't break a swing because we haven't got any, um, but I don't, I don't, I don't know any other details. Okay, mm. I don't want to know. Um, I would feel instinctively very, very uncomfortable uh, if someone were to sanction them for doing so, because pre you know people doing a, you know a remarkable, a demanding job, preserving morale is part of the job of the manager. It's not just enforcing you know uh, whatever the compliance department's rules are. It's also making sure you have a you know a team that continues to function with high morale. True. Okay. And if you if you were to come in and say, you know, having a cake and two bottles of beer in an office where people were already co-located is technically in breach of the rules, OK? That's a case where the rules are running contrary to your instinct as someone who manages any team of people, OK? 
And in the same way, I, I'm, you know, the, I mean, the, the classic example of that, where there's the law and there's your instinct, you must know this, okay, you have a motorway and every lane has a 50 limit, right? And you're driving along and you, you, you know you're supposed not to be going more than 54 miles an hour, but the car to the left of you is going 54 miles an hour and there's a really, really strong driver's instinct that you go a bit faster than the car to the left. Because on, a, in, in, on British roads, not, not true in US interstates, they don't have the same kind of default. But in British motorways, the reason the car drives a bit faster than the car to the left, we don't drive side by side for long periods, is because apart from anything else, if you don't have that, no one can change lane. You get a kind of complete gridlock, OK? And <coughs> I always suffer that same kind of instinctive urge versus rule. And I always, I'm always conscious of that conflict, which is, I mean, I'm the only, I'm the only person in uh, the British press to have, was it Chris Hoon, who was the, who, who was the Labour, the Lib Dem politician, the Lib Dem leader who got a speeding t And his uh, wife ticket. took it. It was Chris Hoon. His wife. Chris I think, Hoon. I think Chris he Hoon. was, yeah, he was a Liberal. No, I think it was Conservative. Uh, no, no, he was, he was definitely Lib Dem. It was, li think, it, was lib it was Lib Dem, his wife took it. His, his six wife points, was Vicky yeah. Price, the economist, took it and then yeah. blagged on him. That was ridiculous. The fact that he had to resign over that. I think, or, or, or he quit. Yeah, well, Did he well, quit? Well, or... I've got a very complicated one there. That's, I think that's dumping, ridiculous. Dumping the ticket on your wife is is actually a re resignation effect. And, 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 and getting a fine, getting a fine isn't for for breaking COVID rules like um, our no, current. My only, my only objection to that is that the particular speed camera that got him on the M11 near Chigwell. And I've actually had a conversation with the Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman about this very speed camera. Okay. <laughs> It, this is a really interesting question. As you do. This is a really interesting question, which is sometimes called Wittgenstein's ruler, which is, are you using the ruler to measure the table or are you using the table to measure the ruler? If you have a speed camera, which, as is the case with this particular speed camera, yeah. catches, like, ten times more people than any other speed camera, OK? There are, let's be honest, two possibilities, OK? Mm -hmm. One of which is this is a stretch of road which is unbelievably dangerous where everybody breaks the law and it's terrible, OK? The other one is that the signage or the speed limit is unreasonable, which is why so many people get caught. Now, if you look at this, okay, this particular speed camera, people are basically tooling down the M11. They've just, they're going 80, let's be realistic, okay? It's one o'clock in the morning in Chris Hume's case. Um, they're going 80, um, and you basically cross the M25 as you approach Chigwell. Uh, there's a sign that says 50, <coughs> right? And then about 200 yards further on, I can't remember the exact speed distance. Camera. The speed camera. With yeah. the 50 limit. Now, hold on a second. Okay. Every driver who's any good has a real reluctance to slam on the anchors and decelerate to that degree in that shorter distance because you might get hit by someone behind or cause a truck to jackknife or anything. It just feels a dangerous thing to do. Yeah. So using all their instincts, their innate tacit instincts of the driver, they slow down gradually past the speed camera going at 61, okay, and get flashed. Now, I would argue the extreme success of that speed camera is not evidence of Chris Hoon's guilt as a driver, it's evidence that someone needs to ch reposition the speed camera, reposition the speed limit, change the design of the road, okay? That's fascinating. So, I, 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 I would I mean? love to dig I, I, into You that, must know this, as a South Londoner, you must know... Uh, in South London, you must know there's a very, very famous bus lane camera which catches almost everybody. I can't remember where it is in South oh, London. Oh, there's quite a few. There are quite a few. If you ask but my mum, I'm always... It is uh... more or less impossible to turn left yeah. without veering into the bus lane, OK? Now, all your instincts as a driver go, I'm going to cut in a bit early because otherwise I'm going to risk an accident. And you do the sensible thing and you end up breaking the law. Yeah. Now... At some level, I'm conscious of the fact that what Cummings was doing by going to Durham, not by going to Barnard Castle, not by going into 10 Downing Street, was, by his calculation, the best thing he could do to make sure his wife and child were safe and looked after without actually exposing anybody else to the virus. I think it was probably the right calculus, actually. Mm. Okay, um, And so you have that fundamental problem, which is... Uh, you know, if if law is designed in a way that it runs completely... Con Do you know this, by the way? I, I was listening to this thing, uh, which is a kind of uh, autobiography of a guy who made... a kind of Chinese-American who made a lot of money in China in the early boom. Do you know, most Chinese laws, wait for this, mm. are actually introduced retroactively. 
Really? So you can do something, make a lot of money doing it, and someone in the Communist Party decides of that course. you don't like you doing it. You stop doing it, and they arrest you for having done it before <laughs> the law was introduced. <laughs> now, you know, when, I, when I talk about there are a lot of things about our existing institutions that are actually really intelligent and clever, and we're not being crazy fighting to preserve them, because there's an evolved intelligence there that you can't necessarily recreate by design. Mm. You know, those kind of things which we take for granted, no one's going to make a law and then impose it retroactively. Surely, right? Yeah. We take those things for granted. But actually, we're wrong to do that because other people don't think of them as obvious. I don't think we would end this podcast talking about Dominic Cummins. But here we are. But I think it, it does touch on, touch on something very important, which is our approach to law, our approach to what's right yeah. and, and, and morality and things like that. And I mean, this is a running kind of way I end these conversations. We've got to do this again and maybe talk a bit more about, about morals. I think that would be... <laughs> I didn't think I would line up with your wife, but there you go. No, no, no. I mean, she would take very much the, these are the rules, you obey them, that's the end of the story. And um, uh, this is the worst thing I have, which is my wife does my... Uh, my wife, who's a vicar, does my tax returns, OK? OK. And it's like having the world's shittest accountant. <laughs> Because she'll say things like, when you attended that conference in Potsdam, they gave you a free pen. Don't you think you wanted to go? <laughs> right. I'm going, jeez, you know, please, can we just give some more money away? You know, can you find something else that I have to give away? Yeah. Thank you so much for this conversation, Rory. This is really fun. <laughs> All right.